So it's it's 1 p.m. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone uh, from wherever you are connecting all over the world. You are welcome to this event. This is hosted by the Department of Petroleum Engineering under the College of Petroleum and Geosciences at the King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals in Saudi Arabia. And this event is organized in partnership with the King Fahad University Institute of Knowledge Exchange. And it is free for all the attendees here because our speakers have made it possible this to happen and really appreciate it. So without wasting time, we would I will share the schedule for this uh, meeting for our attendees to, to be aware of. And then I would um, go ahead to uh, welcome the Dean of the College of Petroleum and Geosciences for the opening remarks. So after the opening remarks, um, Dr. Abdulaziz would lead us in the general view of artificial intelligence. And then we will move to the first session of this uh, talk, which is the geology, geophysics, and general geoscience applications, uh, where machine learning and artificial intelligence have made problem solving very easy. So that will be um, led by Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Umar, and then Dr. Roderick Perez from the University of Vienna. So then after then we would have a 10 minutes break. Then before we move to um, Dr. Mohamed Kanfa session, where he will talk about AI and ML application intelligence lead. And then we will also move to a prestigious professor here in KFUPM professor uh, Salahuddin Kakatne, who would lead us in the applications in drilling analytics. Then we'll move to class-based ML application. We have an expert from Shalom Beji, Turkey, Alogman will handle that. And then uh, and our esteemed head of machine learning in Aramco's America, uh, Dr. Wichan Lee, who will handle the applications, the reservoir characterization and factual monitoring. Then Johannes would um, Nuwara uh, from the Research Institute of Innovation, Innovative Technology for the Earth would give us a brief insight on how data analytics have been instrumental in solving challenges with carbon capture and storage. And then uh, Dr. Sa uh, Salem Agabi would summarize this um, session. Then we will have a general question and answer session. So um, I, I welcome Dr. Abdulaziz Alkabi, the Dean, College of Petroleum and Geosciences, hosting both the Department of Geosciences, the Department of Petroleum Engineer for his opening remark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Clement. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, wherever you are dialing from. And uh, it's really, it gives me a great pleasure and honor um, to give this opening remarks for such an important uh, event. And thank you um, in advance to all the speakers and the participants. I have to say that my first encounter with the AI was almost uh, 33 years ago uh, during my graduate studies at, uh, at the US. So maybe you can make small calculation about my age. At that time, there was a, a big hype uh, associated with the um, with the subject, but also there was lots of skepticism and disbelief about what AI uh, can do. I believe AI techniques and tools have come a long way. And currently AI seamlessly enhancing many aspects of our, uh, our lives. And KFUBM has recognized this and all our graduates um, now regardless of their area of, of studies, uh, should have the foundations to make them appreciate and realize the benefits of data sciences and, and AI in general. Um, and briefly, and for this, in all our undergraduate programs at KFUBM, um, we introduce three digital enablers courses covering programming languages that are specifically good for data sciences and AI like Python and C++. We also have uh, a course introducing data science and also introduction to AI. In addition, we 
the university created opportunities for our undergraduate students to take uh, more specialized courses from other relevant programs within the university and, and uh, form it under a concentration so that when they leave us and they go to the market, they become more, uh, more attractive. Uh, going uh, or, or coming closer to, um, uh, to our area of specialization in the oil and gas industry, especially the upstream uh, sector, and due to the size of our oil and gas resources, we deal with a huge influx of data and information. This represents a great challenge uh, to the interpreters as well as uh, the decision makers. To comprehend in a timely and efficient uh, manner. AI techniques and machine learning in particular represent a unique opportunity to deal with such a challenge. Our MX um, professional master program on the intelligent hydrocarbon fields and specialized courses on AI applications and petroleum engineering and do sciences are geared toward capitalizing more on the opportunities in this important uh, field. I sincerely look forward to listening to some of the presentations, the presenters, and learn more uh, about the interesting topics uh, they will cover uh, today. I conclude uh, my opening remarks by thanking the management of KEX as well as Petroleum Engineering Department for um, uh, hosting and organizing a timely event uh, and, and uh, I wish you all a very enjoyable time this afternoon. Thank you very much, Clement. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Dr. Abdulaziz, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And we thank you for your generosity in CPG and your support for both petroleum and geoscience programming in general. So we'll be welcoming the chairman of the Petroleum Engineering Department, who also served as the head of the committee for this um, program organized to give his own opening remark. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's our pleasure and honor really to have and host this uh, timely topic on uh, data science, machine learning applications to the oil and gas challenges. I mean, this is uh, ever increasing uh, uh, important technology that is uh, having place to uh, address challenges uh, and open opportunities in many, many sectors. And of course, uh, that will include oil and gas industry. Uh, always uh, we academicians or in the operation or research institute or researchers uh, always look for solutions to our challenges, uh, uh, challenging oil fields oil and gas fields uh, that are maturing by, by, the, by the second. And uh, we are going to go away from uh, easy oil to the difficult oil and gas, uh, including and conventional resources. And always the objective for all what we do uh, is to maximize recovery, reduce costs. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, uh, we have today with us at least um, 10 speakers who cover a wide range of aspects of the machine learning and uh, data science applications. They come from regional, uh, from the college, from the department, from uh, Saudi Arabia, from global. It's all from Japan all the way to uh, uh, Vienna and beyond. And we are really honored to, to have you all and uh, to be listening to you. And uh, we will be all certainly enlightened and uh, B, uh, we understand this technology more. What are the opportunities it gives to us and what are the limitations potentially, potentially uh, currently or the challenges that the, this industry has or this technology has uh, so that it can offer us more in the future, inshallah. Uh, uh, all what I can say is I'm looking forward to uh, 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 listening to the speakers, learn, learning from them uh, as we go and march together forward. Uh, I thank you all for, uh, for accepting the invitation, the speakers, as well as the audience who are, uh, have registered for this important event. Uh, again, I reiterate what uh, Dean Abdelaziz mentioned, uh, thanking uh, the KICS 
team uh, led by Dr. Mohammed Al Mahaini, who have promoted and helped us a lot in, in, uh, in promoting this event and distributing it. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee and uh, many of many have participated in this, Dr. Zishan Tariq and Clement Babu, uh, our host uh, our, uh, this uh, today, who has uh, done a lot. He is, uh, by the way, uh, is our SPE uh, student chapter president as well as a candidate for PhD. So thank you, Clement, for all the efforts uh, uh, put in organizing uh, uh, this event. Uh, I would like again uh, thank you all. Uh, I welcome you all. I look forward to the outcome from this uh, uh, this uh, event during the event and beyond that. And after that, this is an opportunity to. Uh, enhance our network in this subject as well as uh, hopefully collaborate uh, to uh, advance the technology and uh, make better use of it. With that, I return it back to you, Clement. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Doctor, uh, for this wonderful and short uh, introduction as the chairman and also the head of this committee. Uh, thanks for the work done in organizing the uh, the planning stages and everything. So I would like to invite the uh, professor here is in charge of the machine learning courses that we have here. Um, he will give the general overview. I'll give a brief overview of his bio then while he gets ready to share his um, uh, presentation. Uh, doctor, Can you give me the authority to share the presentation, please? Okay. Okay. So Dr. Abdulaziz Abdurrahim is an associate professor in the Department of Petroleum Engineering at King Fahad University, Dharan, Saudi Arabia. The focus is mainly on geomechanics and the application of artificial intelligence in different areas of petroleum engineering. Before joining the department, he has worked as a research engineer in the research institute at King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals for almost 18 years, addressing fifth challenges in areas such as weapon instability, sand production, and experimental rock mechanics. He has published presently almost 200 journals and conference papers in the areas of geomechanics and the application of artificial intelligence in petroleum engineering. So uh, may you have the floor, Prof. All right, thank you. I hope uh, my voice is clear, is that okay? Is, is my voice clear? Okay, so let's continue. So my topic is general overview of artificial intelligence. And uh, artificial intelligence is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines or use of computers to model the behavioral aspects of human reasoning and learning. And uh, here is a nice chart where you can see artificial intelligence there. Uh, and uh, the offshoots are machine learning, natural language processing, speech, expert systems, robotics, vision, and so on. And we are uh, focusing more on machine learning as we will see. And in machine learning, you have deep learning and predictive analytics and so on. What is machine learning? Machine learning is a scientific discipline concerned with design and development of algorithms that allow computers to learn based on data. And major focus is to recognize patterns and make decisions. And it is based on statistics, probability theory, data mining, pattern recognition, and so on. And there are many applications of machine learning. I have only 15 minutes, so I'm try trying to uh, pick up uh, and focus on most important things. So these are you know, different areas like machine perception, computer vision, la natural language processing, search engines, and so on. There are many machine learning algorithms, the most important of them that we used in, that we use in petroleum engineering are supervised learning. Okay, supervised learning algorithms. There are others also that we will not focus here. Data science is also a theme of this uh, workshop or this forum. So data science is an interdisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, and systems to extract knowledge and insights. The growth of uh, AI and machine learning has been actually exponential these days. Industry leaders are more welcoming, as uh, Dr. Kavi had said earlier, 
in fact, when I also was, uh, you know, I used to visit uh, industry like 15, 20 years ago and talk about this, or just 10 years ago, when we talk about AI, there will be many people sitting in the audience who will make faces. They'll say, oh, come on, this is machine learning, you're just fitting formulas. <laughs> and so, but the time has changed now. Everybody is, is feeling proud to talk about machine learning. So we have increased projects, conferences, and publications. You can see the general trend of uh, publications uh, on machine learning. Uh, this is general, but the next slide shows uh, growth of publications by specific fields. So you have uh, uh, machine learning and probabilistic reasoning, neural networks and computer vision, natural language processing, and so on. But when it comes to petroleum engineering, uh, the trend has been continuously increasing, and here are different methods of machine learning, like ANN, which is artificial neural network, and this uh, still is the best uh, tool of uh, tool of machine learning. And I also advise my students to use this. And in fact, uh, as as uh, mentioned by Dr. Fabi, we were uh, we are one of the first universities to implement a uh, graduate course in machine learning for petroleum engineering and also for undergraduate students. So ANN is the kind of topper in this one. And then we have PSO, particle swarm optimization, fuzzy logic, support vector machines and genetic algorithms and so on. So the growth has been there, uh, you know, now most conferences and workshops and symposia have a session on AI and more and more journals are focusing it. Just two months ago, uh, we published a review. I think uh, it's a review of 36 pages. And uh, then by nine authors in the College of Petroleum and uh, Geo Petroleum Engineering and Geology, CPG. And it was published in Journal of Petroleum Exploration and Technology. It was published in September, uh, just this year, two months ago. And it says a systematic review of data science and machine learning applications to the oil and gas industry. So this is a, a wonderful, I would say, reference for you to download and talk about it after this, um, after this, uh, I would say, forum. So I will pick uh, some of the things because this is very fresh, uh, some of the things from this paper itself and present to you uh, what has been going on in this area. And I kept timer in front of me. I have nine minutes in front of me, so I will try to see how much I can talk about. So here we have, uh, for example, uh, here are different models that are used to achieve objectives like analytical, numerical, statistical, and probabilistic. Uh, these are different models, but uh, in statistical, we have data-driven models also. So there is a continuous, like uh, traditionally we have been used, uh, we, we have been using physics-based models. And now in recent days uh, with the earlier struggle between physics-based and uh, recognition of database models, uh, there has been you know, always arguments. So here are some of the advantages and disadvantages of physics-based models and database models. Database models, we are focusing machine learning models. So physics-based models, the advantages are they are strong, they have strong basics, they're based on, they're based on existing solid knowledge, they're easy to interpret, you can detect errors and uncertainties and avoid them, and there is lower permeable probability of bias and easy to be generalized to other problems, and so on. And uh, there are disadvantages of physics-based models also, that is hard to integrate historical archive data with these models. And they are prone to numerical instability, especially when you, uh, you know, encounter complex boundaries. And uh, the, you need to have a vast physics knowledge in this domain and has high computational power requirement, especially if you're uh, you know, addressing uh, complex boundaries and so on, uh, using or applying this to numerical methods and so on. And assumptions need to be set in advance. And that is a very big restricting, I would say, condition for physics-based models. You start with, for example, I'm in geomechanics, you say everything is isotropic, homogeneous, elastic, linear. So you kind of you know, restrict the material to very uh, narrow domain. And by restricting that, you kind of go far away from reality and you don't represent reality in most of the cases. 
Whereas data-driven models have a lot of advantages. Uh, they consider the historical data and experiences, that is whatever you have been observing from the field or from the laboratory, you just you know, incorporate them. They're able to stably make predictions after training and they do not require knowledge of the domain as it depends mainly on data. So artificial intelligence or neural network or fuzzy logic, it doesn't know whether you're talking of uh, you know, some medical cases or, or, or engineering or anything or business. It just works with data and deals with heterogeneous data and is able to enhance performance over time and can detect complicated relationships and patterns, which is really, really not possible in, uh, in, in uh, analytical models. But there are disadvantages of data-driven models also. The biggest disadvantage is it is black box in nature and therefore we have interpretability issues. And uh, data availability is the main concern. And you cannot detect errors or uncertainties, okay? And it is affected by bias in the data. If your data itself is not representative of, uh, uh, of, of the physical phenomenon, then you will have the, uh, the bias there also. It is not easy to generalize. And this is one of the main, uh, I would say restriction, but I would say uh, this is not a restriction in the sense that we in petroleum engineering are addressing different reservoirs and different, uh, I would say oils or whatever, and each of them have its own regional, I would say, um, uh, conditions. So uh, whatever model you come up with in the world, there will not be enough, I would say, um, generalization available in a particular formula. So I would not really consider that as a big uh, limitation. Okay, and uh, sometimes if you are out of the boundary of data or extremes, you cannot use machine learning models to predict. And uh, if, if you go in the paper, you have a very nice uh, summary of limitations of AI and ML models, machine learning models like overfitting, coincidence. I mean, coincidence is you may have uh, by chance a uh, nice uh, match but that may not be representing the whole field. Similarly, overtraining, data availability, interpretability, generalization, and bias. So I have only five minutes remaining. So let me just, uh, so this is, uh, this is what I have already discussed, physics-based, I'm sorry for this uh, uh, font size, which is limitation if you're watching on your mobiles, but uh, there is a limitation that, uh, I mean, I want to cover and show you what is there in the paper so you can go and refer to uh, it uh, after the after the forum. So uh, these are what the, the, the limitations of physics-based and data-driven models that I already presented. And uh, here is a summary of selected hybrid models in the oil and gas industry. Okay, so you can see the applications and the components like uh, model in uh, drilling engineering, oil and gas production, reservoir characterization, uh, and so on. And table four gives commonly used machine learning tools with their advantages and disadvantages. There's not a time to talk about them, this is too detailed, but I'm telling you a nice reference and uh, which is prepared with a lot of effort. So here is ANN and then fuzzy logic and then SVM support vector machine and decision tree and K nearest neighbors and random forest and K means and fuzzy C means and recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks. And, uh, and so on. Then we have another table which sum gives summary of researchers, researches related to application of AI in predicting permeability and porosity. So these are different top papers uh, that have been uh, addressing that. Similarly, predicting water saturation. So these are different papers in water saturation. And uh, then we have uh, in geomechanical parameters, and then we have in drilling fluids and, uh, and, 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 uh, and so on. And uh, here is a, one of them, you see, common machine learning techniques used for rate of penetration predictions in drilling. Now I'm just taking a representative case in uh, petroleum engineering, but it shows kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, preference or in performance and in the use of ANN. ANN is like more than 50%, then comes fuzzy logic, SVM and others. So this gives a very good idea of the strength of these models. And that is true for any other application such as in reservoir engineering or reservoir characterization and so on. So these are different uh, reviews in cementing and so on. 
So with my two minutes remaining, let me just uh, go over the concluding remarks. I would say machine learning has huge potential in solving problems because of two important factors. And here we are kind of uh, uh, the kings uh, in terms of uh, coming up with this approach. What are those factors? We deal with nature rather than man-made materials and processes. So reservoirs, you cannot predict the property of reservoir from this point to this point, just one inch away, you may have things very much different. Secondly, the data produced is too large. So we are lucky to have on that side, even though that data is not available to especially uh, the faculty or the, the academics, but still the data is too large. And the biggest challenge, therefore, is to have access to laboratory and or field data, especially for the academicians. And then the internet, the internet of things and the live relay of data from drilling and production facilities uh, it will open a lot many opportunities in the future. And data cleaning and uncertainty quantification is another huge area. In fact, I see this uncertainty quantification integrated with AI will open another huge opportunity because there are a lot of issues in, uh, in drilling data, like one of my students is working on data cleaning and similarly uncertainty quantification. I mean, uncertainty is there in, 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 um, in experimental data and also you know, in log data because of the washouts and breakouts and so on. And uh, another challenge is you have to understand the physics. The more you understand that some people think that without physics, you just fit uh, the equation or they just uh, throw the data in and let the machine learning solve it. It will never work like that. And uh, uh, you know, all my students initially have that impression, but then they realize they wake up from the harsh dream that it doesn't work like that. And they have to understand the physics first. And you also, uh, for example, in certain cases of uh, machine learning problems, you you can uh, you can uh, really uh, you need a lot of algebraic equations like in PVT, and you have to be really sensitive and uh, expert in seeing how each algebraic equation controls things. And there are challenges that I have uh, mentioned earlier, like all fitting coincidence and ever training. And last thing is, let us educate our uh, engineers, especially in industry, and especially in the situation where the industry does not want to share the data with academicians. So at least let the academicians train these engineers so that they can go in the industry, keep the data to themselves, and then at least solve the life problems that they are encountering. With that, I think my time is over. Thank you very much. And I um, give the speak to speaker to control to our uh, coordinator. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Uh, before we go to the geology session, uh, which, which involved three main speakers, Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Umay Wahid, and Dr. Roderick Perez. Some people have a few questions here. Maybe we can take one or two, depending on how complex it is. Then we will move the rest of the question to the general uh, question and answer session and closing remark, which is 15 minutes um, uh, to the end of the uh, main uh, forum. So some questions here. The first one, for, for instance, is, uh, can we use deep learning in petroleum and geosciences and geophysics? Which two is a is a powerful? Or maybe the audience trying to ask which tool is more powerful? Uh, which two is more powerful for deep deep learning in petroleum and geosciences? So maybe, maybe doctor, you can just give a brief. Um, uh, well, well, uh, yeah, I would say uh, as far as uh, image recognition is concerned, especially like in geophysics and seismics, maybe deep learning is, is uh, much more uh, relevant there. And uh, in, in, uh, in terms of predictions, uh, especially for petroleum engineering, you can use and people are using nowadays the deep learning in that area also. But the basic tools are good enough. But when it comes to image recognition or like, let's say, uh, thin section uh, recognition, or especially the seismics, uh, deep learning perhaps is the area to, to go into. But I should say I have not uh, done um, any work in geophysics in a deeper work. So maybe our colleagues in geophysics uh, can comment uh, better there. Yeah, when we get that session, they would handle that. Yes. I believe the audience would get. So somebody was also, do you think machine learning will eliminate dependency of experimental and simulation? 
approach or not at all. presented review articles findings so i hope your deep insight about this area would help to answer the question well my simple answer is it will never ever replace the experimental uh, observation in fact machine learning is based on experimental observations and uh, then what is the use of machine learning what it does is uh, it basically helps you to minimize. Uh, for example, if you are able to predict permeability in one well, uh, where you have measured core-based observations or experimental, whatever they are, then you can, instead of measuring those uh, things in every well, you can uh, you know, uh, minimize that. Uh, out of 15 wells, if you have just measuring in one well is enough, and then the surrounding 15 wells can be predicted using machine learning. So it minimizes, but it, you cannot start without experimental data. That's very, very important. Otherwise, how are you going to uh, you know, cross-check how the predictions of machine learning are, or tools are? Okay, so can we um, combine physics-based model and data-driven model? Somebody is asking. Yes, uh, you know, in a way, but uh, frankly speaking, uh, what we have found is uh, when it comes to machine learning, uh, I didn't find much benefit, uh, even though we have explored at least, uh, you know, um, we have published more than 100 papers in this area. So in these areas, our personal experience is you can use uh, physics based, uh, whatever tools you have or formulas you have, you can use them as an input into the input data of uh, machine learning tools, it may help, but uh, it's not necessary. Uh, our observation is, unfortunately, it doesn't help much. Well, can we introduce to real world cases where AI and data science have been used? I will answer this question. Um, other speakers will introduce us to real world cases where data science have been used. Somebody at what factor determine which to be used between physics-based model or data-driven model? These have been very deep debates. Oh, uh, actually, the basically when your physics-based model is able to predict, let's say, with 90-95% accuracy, you don't definitely need any machine learning tools. It, the use of machine learning only you know comes into picture when you are helpless. And there are many, many cases in uh, petroleum engineering because we are dealing with Earth, with nature. So our physics-based models, which are based on extremely limiting assumptions, like I give you the example of uh, geomechanics, elastic, homogeneous, isotropic, and so on. So you kind of go far and far away from reality. And there, that's where machine learning helps you overcome those limitations. OK, so um, somebody did, I think the other questions can be answered in the course of this presentation by other speaker, the one about the revelation with tools in how these have been used for oil and gas problem, which is why we are holding this uh, forum. Did you publish any research on comparison of results of physics-based and data-driven model? Someone is asking. Uh, we always, uh, wherever uh, the physics-based, if the physics-based model is able to predict, as I said, with 90, 95% accuracy, there is no need of machine learning. People say, why are you doing it? But uh, if there are correlations which have some kind of semi-empirical uh, or semi-relationship, uh, you know, then we always compare our performance with those of physics-based uh, or empirical-based correlations and the field data. And we always found, find that AI is able to perform that. OK, so uh, is there a maximum percentage of data that successfully trained to say that the prediction built from machine learning can be used? Our, uh, yeah, our, our, our simple uh, rule of thumb is you should have at least 100 observations. So which programming languages are used? You, are, are you using in proposed ML course? Is it Python? Uh, Python and uh, MATLAB. In other words, those are the prerequisites to use of ML. Yes, yes. When we have, OK, so um, there's also somebody was asking you post the titles of the papers. In the okay. Comments. Yeah, it is somebody has already posted, but I will also again post it. In okay. The... So now we will thank you all for your questions and uh, comments. So in consequence sessions, I believe so many questions we have will be answered because we have the exploration speakers are coming. We have like three of them lined up. Then after them we'll have a ten minute break. So so we welcome um, a Dr. Omar Wahid. He's an associate prof 
um, I mean, an assistant professor here at Geophysics, and he will be discussing on some of the ML application in Geophysics. And I think he will also be talking about deep learning. So I see some questions on, can we use deep learning in Geophysics in Geology? So this is an opportunity for you to ask those related questions in machine learning and deep learning as related to Geophysics. So you are welcome, Doctor. Perfect, thank you, Clement. Uh, could you please confirm everything is okay here? And I can go ahead. Okay, I hope you guys are able to hear me. Clement, is that right? I don't hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Abdulaziz. Perfect, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, it's a great uh, pleasure actually to be part of this uh, forum and presenting about our work that we have been doing on the front of uh, using machine learning of uh, geophysical exploration and, and micro seismic monitoring as well. Uh, so first of all, I think we're all excited about uh, what machine learning has done and has the potential to do uh, for our industry. And it's because not always we see an industrial revolution unfolding in front of our eyes. And the one that we are seeing right now is what is being dubbed as the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and what what separates fourth industrial revolution actually from the third one is, is the pace with which technology is advancing and how it is kind of merging uh, with our lives, right? So think about technologies like uh, voice activated personal digital assistants, healthcare sensors, self-driving cars, and so on. So it's kind of becoming more and more part of our lives. And one of the biggest enablers of the fourth industrial rev revolution is artificial intelligence or machine learning. Uh, so in today's talk, what I'm going to talk about is really uh, different applications of, of machine learning and deep learning and some of the problems that we have been doing uh, in areas such as geophysical exploration and some of geology uh, and, and, and where can we go from there and what are the challenges ahead of us. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to briefly talk about is detecting micro seismic events during deep learning. So the reason uh, this problem is important is because when you have, uh, for example, when you are doing uh, shale gas operation, for example, or doing hydraulic fracturing or uh, monitoring enhanced geothermal systems, you wanna make sure uh, you sort of understand what's going on in the subsurface and you monitor uh, fracture evolution that is, that is happening. Uh, or in, in, in general, in conventional oil and gas operation, as well as in the case of Groningen, we have seen uh, a number of, uh, let's say, seismic, seismicity associated with these uh, gas extraction in the field of Groningen. Uh, so the challenge that happens here in micro seismic event detection is that these events are typically of low magnitude. And therefore, when you have sensors at the surface, uh, they can easily get uh, confused with ambient noise or you have noise, for example, due to cars or ocean or something else in, in the area. And it's very hard to detect those uh, micro seismic events because they are very weak and small in magnitude. So one of the things we did here was understand how a human would go about detecting it, you know, when looking at waveforms. Of course, we cannot a uh, human cannot do all of this analysis visually, and therefore we wanted to understand how a human would go about it and then replicate that through the use of, of deep learning. Uh, so one of our experts uh, uh, or one of our co-authors as well, so the way he would understand this problem is, or how, how he would separate event from noise is to look at whether it is coming from below or above. And the way you could see it on a multi-level sensor network is where the energy comes first. So you could, if you see something that is arriving first at the lowest sensor, it means it originated somewhere in the subsurface, which means it's a true event. On the contrary, you could have some sort of this pattern where it comes first on the top surface or, or top receiver and then it travels downward. So you could use this to really train your deep uh, learning network to understand the difference between uh, between my weak micro seismic events and large noise. Uh, once you're able to detect events, you also want to locate these events to understand how uh, few, uh, fractures are propagating. Here is an application of using artificial neural network trained on synthetic data uh, to locate these these uh, these uh, events with with high accuracy compared to traditional or conventional methods. Uh, another place where we've successfully used deep learning is in computed tomography. So in computed tomography uh, or in digital rock physics, we are interested in accurate delineation of, of properties, right? And the quality of the image actually controls the accuracy with which 
or the confidence with which you could uh, predict or analyze these properties. And the downside is that if you want to have a high, let's say, good quality images, you need to scan the samples for a long time, uh, which means uh, you restrict your temporal resolution in which you can study different phenomena. So what we do here is we train deep learning network based on, on poor quality image, which is a low exposure image, you can say, so it takes less amount of time. And then we scan the same sample uh, with high exposure, so a better quality image. Uh, and we train a deep, uh, deep learning network map this poor quality image to the high quality image. And we get what we've seen later on after the training, something like this on the right hand side, which shows uh, much better delineation of, of uh, the structure uh, compared to even the high uh, quality scan. And this is one of the uh, powers of deep learning to, to reduce noise uh, from, your, um, from your observations. Uh, another thing that we're doing, so uh, Mustafa talked a lot about uh, application of deep learning in geology. We're also doing a lot of work in this regard with my colleague, Kurhan Aransi. And we also have a setup in, at uh, DTB here in Dharan where we are uh, developing this technology uh, for our clients where they could use our deep learning based models for geologic workflow. Uh, and things that we've been doing is based on bioturbation analysis, phases classification, porosity prediction. It allows us to have fast, accurate, and consistent classifications and improve the productivity of using human efficient intelligently. Right? Uh, and it also allows us to have real-time evaluations rather than waiting very long. So it reduces the cycle time where you have data and then you want to uh, do, let's say, intellectually demanding jobs with this data, you can reduce uh, that time, you can use a convolutional neural network or deep learning based model for that. Okay, so we've talked a lot about, about these methods and the success of these methods, and we've seen uh, other presentation as well. Uh, but what is the trouble with data science methods actually? So there's something we need to understand that these data science methods, as, as mentioned by Mustafa as well, as our black box models, right? So we don't understand oftentimes what are they learning or we don't have control of what they're learning. And one example is, uh, is, uh, what is what was called as the Google flu trends. So this was a system set up by Google to uh, predict the onset of flu based on, uh, on Google search queries. So without any uh, physics or any understanding of how diseases spread, they were just using uh, Google queries to predict the onset of flu. And it worked really well in the beginning in terms of predicting that during the training phase. But as soon as, uh, you know, the training phase was over and, and the model was used, uh, was put to test, it started overestimating to the point that it was uh, taken off uh, and uh, it's no longer in use. And if you look online about, you know, the dangers of data science or dangers of machine learning, you will find uh, a number of uh, examples uh, uh, or a number of articles actually, uh, which talk about why data science can be a dangerous pursuit uh, if we do not take precautions. And here is one example. So this comes from the uh, from a soccer game last year where an AI controller was used to control the camera and it was supposed to track the ball, of course, uh, which is where the action happens. But uh, the camera kept switching between the ball and the bald referee. So you can see that it confused between the ball and the head of the referee. Uh, and, and it was quite annoying, of course. Uh, now, this, this, we, we may laugh at this example, but actually it can be catastrophic when a self-driving car crashes into another vehicle or a human uh, or a medical diagnosis system uh, misidentifies a disease. So it's, it's really important that we, uh, we understand the dangers of, of data, purely data science methods and what can we do about this uh, to overcome those methods. So one of the things I think where our industry should move forward, and it's not being done a lot right now, is, uh, is the use of interpretable or explainable machine learning uh, models. So we have done some work on this, uh, where we compared um, interpretable machine learning methods, such as very simple logistic regression uh, models with, uh, with features that were really uh, very which were critically designed or explored, uh, and we can gain same performance as deep learning methods. The good side is that these are white box models. We can understand these features, or we can interpret those features because of our uh, physical understanding of those features. 
Another direction where uh, we are going in our research is the use of what is called physics informed machine learning for geophysical modeling and inversion. Uh, and, and we have had already some good discussion on physics versus data. Uh, and in, in the field of geophysics, we have scarce observations. We can only observe uh, on the surface and we want, to, we want to understand what is going on in the subsurface. Uh, and therefore we need to, we have developed over you know, past uh, decades, some knowledge in, in physical laws. We don't want to throw away those uh, physical understanding of those phenomena, and we want to couple them with machine learning. So let's see what we can do on this front. So I'm going to give you an example of, of modeling first, that is solving a partial differential equation using physics and form neural network. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of the iconal equation. So iconal equation, basically, if you, for example, you have an earthquake here, it travels to the surface where you have these receivers, it basically tells you the first arrival travel times uh, that it took from this uh, source uh, in the subsurface to this receiver here. And that T is, is what we are looking for. So essentially we could use a neural network actually to predict our travel time solution in this case, or solve the iconal equation. The way we are going to do this is, is first thing we need to understand is that artificial neural networks are universal, uh, 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 because of the universal approximation theorem, we know that they can approximate any continuous uh, function. And therefore that is what we are going to do. We are going to develop or train a neural network such that when we input points in our computational domain, it can tell us what is the travel time from the source. And the way we do it is that we, we use the partial differential equation itself or the residual of it in the loss function. So those of you who have used uh, supervised learning techniques know that we need to calculate some uh, loss function to, uh, to drive the training of our neural networks. In this case, it's not based on error uh, because of some, uh, let's say, label data. There is no label data here. It's just purely based on the partial differential equation. So in the beginning, when you have this randomly initialized neural network, we feed some locations and we say, okay, give me the travel time of these locations. It tells us some garbage, right? Because it's not trained. And that goes into this loss function. It calculates that, oh, the loss is really high. Come on, go back, update the weights until you're able to satisfy the partial differential equation, or in other words, minimize the residual of that PD. So that's what we do. We have published a number of papers on this in the, in the recent uh, year, year and a half. And please feel free to take a, a screenshot of this where you can go and, and take a look at uh, these publications, a couple of those. Uh, preprints are already there and they are in progress. Now, if you want to play with the codes and you want to experience yourself how physics and form neural networks work and you want to implement your own PDs, uh, take a look at uh, this uh, repository uh, on my GitHub account. Uh, it's, it's open for anybody to use and play with. Uh, so feel free to take a screenshot. Okay, uh, the other problem that I'm going to quickly talk about is that in the previous problem, we assumed that we know the velocity. So we were solving a forward problem only that is finding travel times. But in fact, we don't know the velocity model as well, right? So we want to invert for the velocity model as well, given that we have some observations on the surface. And this problem has application in at, at many scales, right? So you can talk about global scale, uh, where you want to invert for the global velocity structure or on a regional level uh, or on a, at a local scale, which is what we do normally for oil and gas operations and even in, in geotechnical studies or CO2 uh, sequestration monitoring. Now, in this case, what we do is that instead of just having a single neural network, we have a second neural network as well. The second neural network approximates the velocity function and all of these feeds into this, uh, this loss term where we have an additional term here, which actually says, okay, I not only want to compute any travel time, but I want to compute travel times that fit the observations I already have on the surface, right? Limited observations, but we still want to fit them. And, and, and here is the iconal term, which says, okay, my travel times should honor the iconal equation as well. That is, it should follow physics. And that's what we do. Just a quick example of cross-hole tomography. We have sources here, receivers here. We collect data only at one end of this model. And we want to recreate uh, the velocity model, which we assume we don't know. Uh, so on, on the left is the true model, initial model, which we start with is in the middle. And here is the inverted model, which takes only six minutes uh, on an NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPU. 
uh, it's it's much faster, much more efficient, and it has a lot of good features because of using physics. We don't have to rely on uh, some form of regularization, which is which has nothing to do with physics. So it's all physics based, and it it gives us really a good, let's say, uh, intersection where physics can help limited observations uh, using machine learning, of course. So here is just a, a comparison of the inverted model uh, profiles. Uh, red is the inverted model. Black is the true one and blue is the initial one. So of course, travel time tomography can give you only the macro features, which then is used, uh, which can be used for in full waveform inversion, for example, to build higher resolution models. And we see a very good fit of the macro uh, features of the velocity. And this is the travel time fit at a couple of for a couple of different sources at the receivers, and we can see that our predicted travel times match uh, the observed travel times in black very well, except at the edges where which is understandable because of the coverage issue for those receivers. Okay, so let me just quickly uh, conclude here. Uh, I think when I go to these conferences like SEG or EAG and all meetings, I see a lot of applications of deep learning. But one thing is clear that as a community, we are still trying to understand where deep learning is able to contribute the most, right? So there is a lot of more talks happening at these meetings uh, and a lot of more people are coming in, which is great for the community. Uh, but I think there is a huge potential that needs to be tapped, uh, which is when we clearly identify the places where we should spend our efforts in, uh, in, in using machine learning. Uh, transfer learning, as Mustafa also alluded to, I think it allows us to learn quickly. Uh, and similarly, as humans, we never learn with a blank slate, right? So transfer learning is going to be key in going forward. Uh, in my personal opinion, interpretable and physics-based models are necessary, uh, and it allows the uh, general public to trust in the model predictions. It's going to be uh, a time, I think, where our industry is going to realize that uh, when we're going to sell our products to clients, uh, we also need to show why should they trust the predictions of our model. Uh, fundamental progress in deep learning may not be easy or fast, but I think we are not at a dead end. There is a lot more growth to happen and it's an exciting time. If you're a new student or a postdoc, you know, this field is, is going to be uh, a great one to contribute to. So with that, I would just like to acknowledge my co-authors on several of the papers I'd mentioned. And I would also like to thank Dean of CPG and Chairman of Geosciences uh, for their support uh, to this research that I've shown today. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the things that I've shown, you can go on YouTube and look up uh, my name and you will find uh, separate presentations for all those topics. And you can feel free to contact me by email or connect with me on LinkedIn for further discussion or uh, uh, other questions as well. I'm also happy to uh, answer your questions that you may have regarding this presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank yes, you so much, Doctor. Yeah, very uh, nice presentation about the use of geophysics. And it's really interesting the way the physics-based model is uh, coupled for the solution of uh, some of those analytical equations. So somebody is asking in GEOP, is there open source for data or it is difficult as same as petroleum site yeah it's I, very I, I, recent review as a recent ml published paper in geos maybe I, I didn't get that clearly so but the first you. one yes thank you for the question abdul rahman uh there are many uh geophysical data publicly available you should look at scg wiki uh and uh labeling would be an issue but i think you if, if you read papers, there are many times people uh, who not only share their codes, but also label data. So that is kind of also advancing uh, the domain. I think uh, there is a lot of work done on, on seismic interpretation. So you might find uh, publicly available data with labels as well at times. Uh, so I, I, I don't have those links right now with me, but if you could send me an email, uh, I might uh, give you some pointers on that. Okay, so uh, no more question, but if you have any question at the end of this whole forum at 16.45 KSA time, real time, you should be able to also ask. So we move on to the last presentation in this exploration uh, session, and then we would invite um, Dr. Roderick Perez to from the University of Vienna to discuss 
the advances in seismic interpretation based on AI and machine learning. So after the session, we'll have 10 minutes break for coffee, and then we'll return to look at a more in-depth approach to looking at other problems in petroleum, because now we've discussed exploration in the um, four in the last three uh, session, and now we would move on to drilling, and we will move, also move on to intelligent feed. We'll move on to formation evaluation. So, but now let's welcome Dr. Roderick Perex. You are welcome, sir. Okay, hello everybody. Um, first, let me share my screen. And um, okay, sure. okay, I hope you can see it. Well, and yes, let's just start by this. Uh, yes, my name is Roderick Perez. Right now, I'm a geophysical engineer with a master in geology, PhD in geophysics, and right now I'm doing my master in data science at the University of Vienna. And I know that we have been talking about what is machine learning and artificial intelligence, and I just want to give a little uh, introduction about it. Basically, we talk when we mention when we talk about artificial intelligence is everything that is um, surrounded or all these algorithms that try to mimic the human behavior. And in the in terms of geoscience, specifically in the talk that I'm going to talk uh, that I want to share with you right now. Everything that is mimic is like doing seismic interpretation, a false interpretation, and everything that it's kind of like a time consuming, okay? And um, I hope that during the, the few slides that I have with, to share with you today, I can convince you that it will help us in the regular time, in, yeah, in our regular workflows. And I'm impressed that, uh, and I also recognize with my previous uh, peers that present before that this is not a new topic. I mean, we have been doing this for, especially in geoscience for a long time ago. I, I know that some of the, the panelists that presented before mentioned that there has been a 30 years in the, in the machine learning world, and that's true. And this is a very simple example that here we have, for example, uh, this is some data set from Darling 2005, published in, a, in an APG. And this is, these are porosity and permeability uh, measurements from a plug. They are uh, 11, okay? Um, and this is basically what we, everything that we do in, in, this, in this world is we take some data sets and we divide it by the training and a test data sets. In the training, as the name indicates, is basically we're taking all this data and we try to combine it or try to fit some um, and reduce a loss function that is the one that I have here below. Okay, that is the uh, mean excuse square. Excuse me, doctor, can you share your screen? We don't see your oh, screen. Oh, shoot. Okay, let me see to share. Okay, now it's working? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, here, um, okay, as I was mentioned before, uh, in this data set, we have uh, 11 measurements. We have a training and a test data set. And in the train, what we try to do is to uh, try to reduce this error. And with the test data set, that usually is between the 15, 30, 20%, we try to compare with data that the data set never has been seen, try to see how good it did it. Okay, and again, this is nothing new, okay, right now, but the main difference is that, of course, we don't have 11 data, uh, 11 points, we have thousands, millions of data points, and this is when we combine the algorithms, the machine learning algorithms or artificial intelligence algorithm with the big data set is where, when we have to have uh, a lot of power, uh, computer power in order to, to perform this. Now that's going to take some a few applications in your science. And a lot of people have been seeing, for example, uh, that one of the main uh, applications is for example, facial classification. And in this case, we have a, like a human interpretation. This is a, 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 an example from the Panama field in Kansas, United States. And here are uh, some of the results of uh, different classification methods. And as you can see here, of course, we are never going to have a 100% accuracy, but when we're talking about to have thousands of wells, these methods 
uh, as in my humble opinion, is give to the interpreter an extra tool in order to make their work faster and better, okay? And this is the typical example in a, a well log classification, but at the same time, this is an example from the people from OpenDetect that also we can perform a well log prediction. This is something that we may do right now, for example, uh, to having a line, uh, having an equation, for example, I'm going to make something crazy, but for example, we can take a gamma ray log and try to predict a sonic log. I mean, there are plenty equations out there that you can that you may use it for that. But right now, in these kind of methods, since we have, for example, in this case, we have more than 500 wells, we can not ex or we can explore not only linear or exponential kind of equations. We may use, especially in neural networks, which are uh, to go beyond and try to have uh, different kind of uh, um, equations that allow us to may or predict wells uh, in this kind of way. And when uh, and also and also here that you we were talking about seismic and for example again this is nothing new for the people who is a little bit older than me for example this is something that they uh, when I just start to study in the early two thousands about a seismic classification okay that it was a tool that it was strata magic and the people I think it's very funny because the people treat it like that like wow and what this um, tool did was basically took or you say, I want to extract seven well, uh, wave forms uh, in or wavelet from, the, from my seismic, and that's what it did. It classified my, um, my wavelet in, in this case, seven. And then as a human beings, then we start to say, oh, okay, now we can create a map. And then I can create a representation of my earth based on this classification. But again, then we can combine this with uh, another attribute and I start to generate maps and I start to, to see channels. But again, this is nothing uh, magic as we, we, we may think before. And basically um, what is, has been changing for the past few years is that we're right now, we're having more and more computer power in order to uh, apply, apply these algorithms. And another and very interesting um, application of all these artificial intelligence algorithms is, for example, the seismic interpretation. For those of you who have the experience to, to, to do seismic interpretation, we know that it's very tedious that you need to go one by one inline cross lines in order to try to match um, the amplitude in a series of uh, layers, and then we can give an, uh, a, a, a sense of all this. And right now I'm going to share with you um, an example from the Poseidon volume. This is an example from the, the team from Amazon. And basically, again, and I want to make this, that everything is start that we take our seismic volume and we divide it in a training a group and a test group in order to validate. and then doing some um, a, a, a skipping some of the inlines, okay, then we can give, then we can have the image that in this case, it will be our, where we're going to do the interpretation. And of course, we need to have a, some kind of label or some kind of guidance in, or we need to provide this into the algorithm and then the algorithm basically what is going to is going to say, okay, this is what you are calling a seismic interpretation. Well, now I'm going to look for you. And in this case, the prediction is the result of the, uh, in this case, the, um, the horizons for based on these inlines and cross lines. And if you do this over and over and over, then you can generate a very good interpret automatic interpretation of, uh, of, the, of the, in this data, okay? Now I'm going to sh share with you also, and I know that a lot of people here is, um, are students, and I'm going to, I hope this can be at the end of this talk, you can have a, a, an initiative in order to, to do 
a good job because uh, or your own thesis because this is a very good topic and then to, to work on your thesis or some kind of um uh, yeah master thesis or, or research project and this is a work from uh Hidian pratama okay and here basically what he did was you can take and the, you can do those, all these in your computer. You can take any a well log and then do your uh, phase classification, okay? And then uh, the idea here is that you need to train all your data, uh, all your data with, of course, plenty of phase analysis, and the, um, and then you can input any kind of uh, data set, and it will generate some phases for you in a very interactive way. And uh, in the same way that we uh, that I showed you already some fault in uh, seismic interpretation, what, uh, what we can do with the fault interpretation. Um, some people may be familiar also with the ant tracking algorithm from um, uh, uh, Schlumberger, okay? And here in the top is the comparison between the ant tracking and the convolutional neural networks. And basically what we can see is that the convolutional neural networks uh, have uh, performed much better than the, the classical or one of the top algorithms at the time, the untracking uh, in, in case of um, doing, uh, uh, yeah, extracting faults, but okay. And the key of all this is something called units that, I mean, since I don't have too much time in this, in this talk, but uh, one of another uh, things that the, this kind of algorithm has been doing is that, for example, they are taking or removing a specific or, or random uh, traces in a seismic volume, and they are telling telling to the to the algorithms, okay, uh, what you can do is try to uh, find what is the or how these traces should look like and then you can complete it. And of course, again, we're taking a training seismic volume and then we're, to, we're keeping that as a test volume, okay? And this is the original uh, area when we you extract some random traces and this is the result. Okay, let's come back again. This is the original. This is when you remove some of these traces and then it's the result. I mean, and it's even almost are very, very good. This is the, the next slide. Is the difference, notice that the, maybe the amplitudes are a little bit different. And uh, just as a curios curiosity or uh, I, I see that, or we can see here on the, on the upper right where the, um, where the reflectors have a high dip is where we have the biggest mistakes. And well, we may suspect suspect because well the the algorithm do not and it, it could uh, do not reflect directly the with the head angles but in general the, this kind of algorithm is very very good and also we can apply the same if, for example when we have holes due to i don't know a lake or some kind of uh, a city that do, uh, that the at the time of the acquisition we couldn't uh, acquire the data and this kind of algorithm also can help us to fill those gaps in an, an another or in a similar data set. And you may ask like, well, how this magic is done? And basically it's not magic. Basically you, are, you need to feed your, um, your, um, uh, your neural network or your algorithm, let's say it. And you need to, to uh, present a lot of uh, examples. You need to, as, as the name says, you need to train them. You need to say, when you find these kind of features, this is where you're going to tell that it's a fault. I mean, for the algorithm, it doesn't matter that it's a fault, that it's a line. That it don't even know. It do not have this geological sense. But then the algorithm is going to be, oh, okay, well, whenever I find this kind of uh, difference, in this kind of image, okay, in the pixels, because we're in, right now we're, to, we're looking into the pixels, pixel level, I'm going to put a, a mark. And in this case, uh, we need to train our example with clean data set, uh, a clean data set. And also we need to, because not necessarily all the cases are the same. Also we are, we need to train our data set with some noise, 
okay? And this is an, an example from Ketut Toto, okay? That also he did a very good job in an, uh, this is the, the, uh, the Netherlands data set that it also, the results are very, very, very nice. Um, also, if you, if you are willing to, to learn more about this kind of techniques, I also recommend you to visit the, the, uh, the website of Professor Wu. He teaches at the University of Texas. And in this case, for example, this is a, one of the biggest and the most amazing examples that I ever see. Um, notice that this is a 3D seismic volume and is a very large seismic volume. It has 300 and uh, let's say that 600 inlines, three, three, more than 3000 uh, cross lines, and let's say that they have 825 samples, okay? And what I'm going to show you is the result of the, uh, the application of these techniques in a very nice uh, or a, in a very complex uh, structural setting, okay? And the best or, or the, the, the best and at the same time the worst is that this job has, was done in less than five minutes, okay? And then we can talk about, uh, about what is the future of us as a seismic interpreters uh, using this kind of techniques. And I'm just going to go back and forth and see the amazing results that I can tell you as a seismic interpreter, I'm really sure uh, with myself, with more than 50 years of experience in the oil and gas business, this kind of results, it will be very impossible to do even in one year of full job, okay? And a, another application in the, of artificial intelligence algori algorithms is for example, doing a kind of the same that we did with the phase classification with the well logs, but for example, uh, with the seismic, uh, try to recognize some patterns. And for example, we if we do and we tell to the algorithm, okay, all these. And okay, and this is an example of the cl phases classification. And notice on the right, the algorithm, the algorithm all uh, try to uh, repeat or try to predict what is the result. Okay, and okay, and let since I think I have very few time, I just want to share with you. Uh, yes, my time is over. Hello. No, just run and and and, and round up um, within five okay. minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at the end, I just want to uh, talk up or do some comments, yeah. Yeah. and at the end is that the. Um, the machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's not a silver bullet. I mean, it's, it's not the solution of all our problems, okay? Not necessarily in the petroleum um, uh, world or in general. I mean, this is just a statistics. And this equation or this kind of equation is what I was talking about. Like this, the, all this is the goal. Try to reduce what I get and I try to compare what it should be and train try to do something called back propagation and in, in general going over and over and over i can reduce the uh, yes. I I can, somebody should unmute um, yeah i mean should mute if you are muted you okay are. well and also and uh, also be to to complete or to summarize before we we're talking about the number of samples and, and accuracy. And since all this is a statistics, in, at the end, we, we would like to say, uh, for example, that if I want to get a 90% accuracy, I should have at least, I don't know, 1000 samples. Could be 1000 samples that could be 1000 seismic lines, 1000 uh, thing section, whatever. I mean, and this is the point. Uh, there is a lot of effort in the in the community to try to understand this problem and to, for example, right now that's not the problem is not to get data. Right now the problem is to get good and quality data in order to to be to enhance the accuracy. 
And also, I know that my, that my previous panelists mentioned that the physical informed neural networks, that's also some of the future and that I think what is going to be in the next couple of years, very interesting. Also uh, in the past, we were talking about what language should I learn about uh, to, know, to, to, to start to do machine learning. And my recommendation is that you should start to be very confident with Python and because it's a general purpose uh, software and it have a very large community which will help you to understand and at least to mimic some of the algorithms that they are already up there. However, in my personal case, and I start to learn Julia because uh, I see it as an, as an evolution of Python and even that do not have so many libraries outside, but it's supposed to be faster than Python. And in my personal case, I don't believe that the neural networks right now are black boxes. Right now, the, the uh, mathematician and, and a lot of community is start to understand that they are not black boxes, that of course there are some procedures, but they are, uh, they are, make, they are being a lot of research in order to understand what is this black box for me. For that reason, I think that not necessarily is a black box at all. And the most important and for all of you that are listening to me, I mean, garbage in, garbage out, and we don't need to be like a push buttons. And I think this, uh, I would like to thanks to the committee uh, to invite me for this conference, because again, the, the biggest message that I want to deliver to you is that we don't need to just be in a push button players. and We need to know what is happening and how all these algorithms are, is going to help us and for me, it's not necessarily our, it is a threat for our uh, jobs, okay? Uh, well, thank you so much for your time. And I'm open for if anyone have any questions about the presentation that I did today. Thank you so much, Dr. Roderick. Um, does anyone have a question? Um, uh, someone raised the hand, but later dropped it. Are you still there to ask a question? Okay, so in the absence of no question, maybe maybe later on the person could ask. We would go for a ten minute break, and then oh, Solomon wants to ask a question. All, all right, uh, you, now you can unmute and then talk. Hello. Yes. Can, yeah, can we can you hear you. Me? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Rodri, for this presentation. It is really really awesome, and I'm highly impressed. So what I want to ask is. Um, in a case where you don't have as much um, data sets to train, so you know the in the convention um, normally you pull like um, eighty percent train, then you test with like twenty percent, or sometimes you can maybe if you have a larger data set you train with like ninety percent and you test with like ten percent. But in a case where you have um, low number of uh, you don't have so much data sets, like maybe you have maybe like like say. 100 in lines and maybe like um, 200 um, cross lines or like that. So um, what do you recommend? Is it um, okay to increase the training percentage or um, we just go with the conventional like 80, 20 rule? Because um, I think training um, your data set, it requires a lot of samples for you to um, give um, accurate results. So what is your take, sir? Well, that's a very good question, and of course, I don't want to bother you with with a with a, a master thesis about it. And of course, I'm agree with you, and I don't want to go so deep about it. But imagine that you are selecting, you have 100 samples of, for example, porosities and permeabilities, and then you get a result with 80 percent of training, 20 percent of tests. But also, a good recommendation is that you shift it, and then uh, right now, you repeat this exercise multiple times. You have you still the you still have the one hundred samples, but then you're going to repeat the exercise with another eighty percent, and keep twenty percent for for testing, and then you're going to shuffle your data again and uh, repeat this exercise again and again and again. This is something called cross folding, and in that in that way you are. Even that you have a, in this case, a 100 sample, let's call it, that is a limited uh, data set. I'm, you I'm are sorry, please. 
excuse me, sir. Can you go back like um, two minutes? My network uh, missed some things. That I just said that uh, I recommend you to to find something called cross cross folding. That in this way, that if you have one hundred samples, that it is let's assume that it's a very small data set, you are going to repeat the eighty twenty. Then you are going to shift our data set and get another eighty percent, and then keep another twenty and repeat over and over five, 10 times. And in that way, you are ensuring that the algorithm is always looking for new data and in the way you can test it better. I mean, that's one of the multiple ways that you can do this. And it is a lot of literature outside that you can review for that. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Roger. Thank you so much, Dr. Roger. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, Clement, in that case, the uh, 10 minutes break. Clement. All right, guys, let's, let's grab some coffee for 10 minutes and then we'll come back. Okay. Uh, welcome back to this session. Uh, Salam alaikum. Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on your time zone. So right now we we'll, we will be going ahead with the presentation by uh, Professor uh, Salah here in KFPM. He's the professor here and the, the the domain champion for drilling and a lot of uh, drilling al uh, analytics um, work and papers and research work that have been led by him, done by so many students. So, uh, doctor, please, if you can share your slide so that we'll move on to the AI and ML application in drilling analytics. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can see the slide now. Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Clement, and uh, the Veteran Department for giving me this chance to present our work for the applications of AI and the machine learning in oil and gas industry. And I will focus at the end of this presentation in the drilling operation, the application of machine learning and drilling operation. Before I can start this presentation, I have to thank Dr. Abaziz Abrahim, who is the leader for the uh, artificial intelligence in the department and the NCBG. And I'd like to thank him because he, who, uh, who is the one who taught me uh, uh, how to apply the AI and publish, as you mentioned, all of this uh, work. We published, together more than 100 or 150 technical paper uh, in different area. So I will go through this presentation about the question raised from the last presentation, what will add the AI and the machine learning in the upstream operation? Uh, I, I will make this presentation like a story in two stages, the development stages when we start working in this one, I'm speaking about myself, almost for six years now working in AI, and then about the application in advanced application for the AI in drilling engineering. Uh, finally, I will conclude and mention about the future work in, uh, in this area. Uh, from one published reference, they mentioned that the uh, application of the machine learning in uh, exploration will save 50 to, will provide 50 to 60 percent reduction in data interpretation time and cost, which means reduction in the time and effort required. For field development, up to 70 percent reduction in engineering hours plus higher value for uh, field concepts. In drilling operation, AI will help in 20 to 30% faster will delivery and more product, uh, production for the well. And in general for operation production, it's three to 5% increase in production. At the same time, almost 40% reduction in maintenance cost. If we put it in a money wise, if we look to this one, if we compare 
uh, uh, the different field in upstream, like exploration, active field development, we can see that by uh, applying the AI, the time required for exploration becomes shorter, and also the time required for the field development become less. When it comes to cash flow, the pay cash flow, as you can see, it's early when you apply AI to get your money back. In addition to this, if you compare the, uh, uh, the production, which is the green color, the production start early with a flat profile as compared before applying the AI. And also the uh, cash flow, as you can see, it starts early and they become like horizontal, way, horizontal stuff, horizontal line, which means the uh, investor will get his money with a higher percentage early. So let me explain about what I mean by development stage. When I start working in the AI, I use the common methods available in the, uh, uh, in the website and Dr. Abaziz gave it to me, like artificial neural network, adaptive neural based uh, fuzzy interference system and support vector machine. I want to mention that I didn't develop any code. These codes are available to be used. What I did from application point of view. So when I started working in this one, we had a project with uh, uh, Saudi Aramco about related to the geomechanics. And as you know, if we need to build a 1D geomechanical model, we need the uh, uh, sonic data, uh, bulk, uh, I mean the sonic uh, compressional wave and shear wave. For almost for the old wells, we don't have the shear wave. So uh, when we applied the available data, we couldn't get the uh, shear wave for the available uh, wells, the few wells that we have the shear wave, when we applied the available correlation, the accuracy was so uh, bad. So we started thinking about application of artificial intelligence to predict the uh, uh, shear wave based on the available log data, such as gamma ray, rho bulk, and neutron prosty. As you can see here, we uh, have a very high quality shear data where the error is less than 5% when apply the ANA. And then our objective was to predict the geomechanical parameter from the logging data, because we predicted from here, we predicted the shear time. So I have the row bulk, delta TC, delta TS, which is the sonic time. And I used this data to predict the E static based on the data I have using a different machine learning like support vector machine, artificial neural network. For sure, all of this work is published and it's online in high quality journal. So after predicting, predicting the logs from other logs to have a complete log profile, we apply the artificial intelligence to predict the geomechanical parameter. Then we have another call, another discussion about it, how we can optimize the drilling operation, drillability, rate of penetration, using the uh, available drilling data in addition to the look data. So we applied the different uh, artificial uh, uh, intelligence system, like here is an example for artificial neural network. And I will explain to you why we applied ANN many times later on. So as a function of the surface drilling parameter, in addition to the uh, resistivity, bulk density, and the gamma ray, we were able to predict the rate of penetration in a real time. And then we can take any decision about uh, the rate of penetration, or if we have a deviation from the planned rate of penetration, we can have a correction to optimize the rate of penetration based on this one. After this, we said, okay, why we include the logging data here? We need just to use the drilling parameter. So the objective here is to predict the, or optimize the rate of penetration using the actual uh, 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 surface measurement of the drilling parameter, such as flow rate, uh, pipe speed, RPM, bump pressure, torque, and weight on bed. By using this one, we were able to optimize the rate of penetration with a high accuracy, almost 99% with an error is about 5%. Then we said, 
Now it's the time to start thinking about the geomechanical parameter. We need to predict the geomechanical parameter, not from logging. Maybe we don't have the logging. Uh, in addition to that, maybe we don't have a logging. As a drilling engineer, we are the guys that first touch the rock. And when we touch the rock, we have a real-time measurement, real-time record of all of the uh, mechanical parameter, drilling mechanical parameter, such as the weight on bed, torque, RVM, flow rate, uh, pressure, rate of penetration, and so on. And here I put an example of how we can predict the E dynamic from the drilling data. And this data were obtained from a surface company and it's for the intermediate section. As we can see here, we were able to predict the dynamic Young's modulus with a very high accuracy where the average absolute percentage error was less than 4% with a very high correlation coefficient. Then, as you can see, this was the development stage where we start applying the main artificial intelligence tools to predict the uh, drilling parameter in different area, like drilling, like geomechanics, like logging. So now, once we have this one and we start having a, a, a funded project with different companies such as Sinovic, uh, uh, Soda Ramco, and other surface company. So instead of depending on these three models, we start applying another three tools such as function network, random forest, and decision tree. And you can ask me why you have six models. One of them can solve the issue. Based on my experience working with the uh, uh, data, especially the drilling data till now, if you are working in a, in a regression way, you will see that random forest and artificial intelligence will give you a better result, especially if you have a huge data set. If your data set is limited, number of data set is limited, maybe random forest will be better. If you have a classification problem, we found that support vector machine give us a good result, in addition to AMFIS. So it depends on the type of the problem that you are trying to solve it. And it depends on the the, uh, 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 the the volume of the data that you have. If you have huge data, maybe most of them will work with you. If you have less data, so you have to select one of them to, uh, to uh, determine which one is the better. The new thing is that we added to the uh, industry, to the publication record is the conversion of the black box to a white box. This is why we have the artificial neural network. What I mean by the conversion to a black box is to provide for the reader, the equation and the weights and the bias that can be implemented without the need for the uh, code or without the need for MATLAB or Python. So we have a complete project about optimization of rate of penetration in complex lithology. So as you know that the rate of penetration has different parameters. We call it controllable parameter, such as weight on bit, RBM, and flow rate. And there are some uncontrollable parameters, such as mud weight and the torque, which is the result of the operation, uh, the pressure, which is the result of the movement of the fluid. And we have some constant parameter. In addition to this, we have different profile. So the rate of penetration horizontal section will be completely different if you have it in S-shaped section or curvature section. For example, here we have a complex lithology. It's a combination of limestone, sandstone, shale, where you have a high or average rate of penetration and a very low rate, rate of penetration. So we were able to predict the rate of penetration using the drilling parameter. And here, the, all of the, our target is to, based on the drilling parameter, to predict whatever parameter that we have. So this is an example for prediction of rate of penetration in a complex lithology uh, uh, field. The second point, after optimizing the rate of penetration, it comes to the downhole measurement. One example of the downhole tools that used to provide data, such as equivalent circulation density, which is very important to give you indication about the bottom hole pressure to prevent any fracture or any losses. 
or to prevent uh, the possibility of the kick. So in this way, we use the artificial intelligence to predict the equivalent circulation density based on the mud weight, drill pipe pressure, and the rate of penetration. The objective of this work is to eliminate the use of downhole tool. I don't mean that eliminate it completely, but for example, if we are working in a field and we have a plan to drill 20 wells in this field. So we can run the, the tool itself, the downhole tool in one, two, three wells. And we will update, update our model based on this data. And we can eliminate the using of the downhole tool in the remaining 17 words. So it will, it would, it will provide, reduce the cost and also the time required for interpretation of the data. In addition to, sometimes you have the tool downhole, but the sensor, sensor is not working. So you have to validate the data coming from this one. One of the issues now, especially for deeper drilling is the effect of temperature on the uh, uh, downhole tools. So sensors stop working after a certain time, especially for hard formation, drilling of hard formation due to the temperature effect. Another example is the from the downhole also measurement related to the downhole torque. As you can see here, this is the actual uh, torque and this is the uh, modeled torque, which is should be the normal one. As you can see, there is a deviation at certain point. The deviation, I mean, you have, will have a higher downhole torque, which will cause twist of to your equipment. It, initially, it will damage your looking equipment, LWD, MWD. In addition to this, it will affect the top drive at the surface. So to reduce the, to, to predict this one, we applied artificial neural network and the different technique. And as you can see, we were able to predict the uh, torque with a very high accuracy where the average absolute percentage error was less than 4%. So we can eliminate the using of the downhole sensor to predict the downhole torque. One of the hot topic now is related to the formation tops prediction. And this is an example of the classification uh, uh, example. I mean, this is not a regression as we, we did for rate of penetration and others. But this is for classification because you have a sequence of formation. For me, the normal way to predict or to, uh, to see the formation tops is from offset wells and the depths you are drilling in. And then from gamma ray profile, it will give you indication about the change. It will be confused when if you have sandstone, limestone, because the, the range is not too big. But for sure, if you have shale, it will be clear. The third way they uh, know the formation uh, uh, change is from the rate of penetration. If all of the parameters are constant, the change of rate of penetration can give you indication about the change of the formation. So here we applied different AI tool and we were able to predict the formation tops uh, with a higher accuracy. For sure, this is just, we published around two papers in this topic but it's for sure it's recommended for future work to apply different AI tool to predict the formation tools with a higher accuracy. This is very important to know where you change from a, a layer to another layer. Number one, to discover early the troublesome formations, the formations that cause problems for you. Number two, because some formation is expected to be the setting depth for the casing. So I need to know when exactly I enter this one. So it will be very, very quick to understand where I am. Going away from the uh, drilling data or using this uh, uh, real-time measurement of the drilling data, the fluid rheology is very, very important. As you know, in, in normal operation, in drilling operation, we measure the rheology twice a day, every 12 hours, complete rheology set. And every 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, we measure the mud density marsh funnel. And we use this one as an indication of the change of the drilling fluid property. In difficult situation, rheological property are measured every six hours, four times a day, which means that at least we have six hours 
without information about going on of the uh, with the drilling fluid. So we thought about this one, and we have one patent about the uh, uh, automated marsh funnel. The objective of this automated marsh funnel is to measure the marsh funnel viscosity and the marsh uh, and the drilling fluid density, and we apply different AI tool for different drilling fluids. So we can use the input data, which is the mud density and the funnel viscosity, and, and the predict is other eulogical property data, such as plastic viscosity, yield point, flow consistency index, flow behavior index, and apparent viscosity. As you can see here, for a specific drilling fluid type, we were able to predict the plastic viscosity with a very high accuracy, where the uh, uh, coefficient of determination was greater than 97%. For sure, to build this model with the automated marsh funnel, which is in the prototype right now, and I hope to see it in the field application soon, we have to uh, uh, develop different AI tool and the codes based on the drilling flow type. Till now, we uh, developed almost 15 different AI code for different 15 drilling fluid types. To do this, you have to have a bank of data, record, huge record of, the, of data to be able to uh, build a strong and uh, uh, accurate model for fluid rheology. So we start applying the artificial intelligence in actual problem. One of the uh, most critical problem, most common problem is related to the loss of circulation. So the objective of this project was to predict the loss zone and the loss rate based on the actual uh, record or actual uh, uh, measurement of the drilling parameter. So the input, as you can see, the input for this model was weight on bed, RBM, torque, rate of penetration, and the horsepower. So we were able to detect the loss zone within a second of penetrating this zone. In addition to this one, we predicted the loss rate. For sure, this is the input data. The output data was the loss rate, which were obtained from the wells where a sensor for the active tank was existing. So this was the base for building this model. Loss of circulation is a very big issue. And if we can just eliminate or predict in advance on a shorter time what's going on, so we can uh, uh, prevent this uh, issue and reduce the time consumed to overcome this issue. The objective of the, of the project was to continue and determine the best LSAM bill that can be used for this one. So based on the loss rate, we determine the width of the fracture. If we assume it, it's a fracture, uh, fracture uh, zone, so we can determine the best bill that can be used to prevent this one. Finally, as I mentioned to you, we have an objective to predict the geomechanical parameter. What I mean by geomechanical parameter, as Dr. Abaziz mentioned before many times, it's related to the elastic parameter, which is elastic youngest modulus and the Boussou ratio, which is in this term of static condition, in addition to the failure parameter, which is UCS cohesion and friction angle. So in this example, I put just the input parameter, which is the surface drilling data, which is available every five seconds. You can make it every half feet, one feet, but in term of time, you can have the record every five seconds. So you have a huge data. And for one of the uh, fields that have the, we have the data for it, we were able to predict the dynamic Young's modulus based on the drilling data. So what I want to say that different AI technique were considered to estimate various parameters related to petroleum engineering. The use of wheel logs and the drilling parameter are efficient in predicting the problem uh, petroleum related parameters. Our objective first was to predict the logs from logs, but now we are working only on the drilling data to predict 
the important parameters such as rate of penetration, other, other drilling issues, or geomechanical parameter. The use of only drilling mechanical property enable real-time prediction of the desired parameter. In addition to the automated marsh funnels that we develop and we introduce it to the industry, which can enable the real-time measurement of the uh, drilling fluid. For a future work, for sure, always there is a future work. There is a recommendation for uh, other researchers to continue working in this area. So we need to continue working for the geomechanical parameter to determine the failure parameter. Other downhole problem, such as cake stuck pipe, it should be considered and it required a huge effort of using the AI and the machine learning to predict this one in advance. Prediction of formation tops, especially if you have a, a quick change from one layer to another layer, especially if you have a thin sections of sandstone, limestone, and so on. So the AI will be perfect for this kind of problem. Downhole measurement, I give example about the torque, about ECD, but we have also downhole weight on bed, downhole vibration, and many things that we need to work and to predict this one that will help to avoid the common issues and common problem existing. And I am a drilling fluid guy. So I, I applied the AI in drilling fluid and then in using the drilling parameter. But what about the cement? There are few papers, few articles related to how we can predict the cement property using the machine learning to avoid the long, lab testing for this one. I will not take more than this. I'm so happy to deliver this one and I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Please, if you have a question, please, um, you can raise up your hand. But for now, we have two in the chat box. So one was asking um, how accurate AI can predict the age of the well to production. What parameters do we need? Oh, the age of the well. Yes, the age of the well. For sure, you, you mean how, how they can predict how long the well will produce, if I understand correctly. Yes, I, I believe so, yeah, to production. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I believe from this one, the main input parameter will be the... The, the main input parameter will be related to the uh, reservoir pressure, uh, <laughs> fluid type, reservoir temperature, and so on. And the output will be the uh, flow rate or the constant flow rate for how long it will be. For sure, it, it, I am sure that AI can, can, can help us in predicting how long the oil will produce in this regard. Okay, the second, were these models deployed in reality and applied in real time operation? Uh, if, you, if, if you mean by the models that we develop, yes, some of these models can, can be applied in real time, can be applied in uh, real operation. Uh, based on the work that we finished with Soda Aramco, some of these models are already uh, uh, implemented in some wells and it gives good results, especially the one related to uh, hole cleaning. Uh, the one related to uh, rate of penetration, it was used to validate the existing result from the offset wells. But for sure, yes, it will be, especially the March funnel time. I discussed the uh, prototype of the March funnel time with different company uh, and even with OFIED and they were so surprised with the model output and the accuracy that we have, and they are just waiting for the prototype to implement this one. I hope that soon we will see the automated marsh funnel in every rig. Another question by an anonymous attendee, what would be the application of ML in unconventional wells or horizontal wells specifically? And for what problem oh, what would be best for, to use? Yeah, for conventional and uh, for conventional, Unconventional wells, yeah. it's a difficult operation. I mean, 
whenever we can we can predict we can apply the ai to reduce the time and uh, help us to take the right decision it will it will save a lot of time effort and cost for horizontal well we apply the machine learning in different things like optimization of rate of penetration especially as you know when we started drilling is horizontal section the control will go to not to the company man or the control will go to the logging guys. I mean, there is a war engineering because they need to measure the properties. At the same time, I need to optimize the rate of penetration, especially for tight formation or unconventional formation. But at least we can use this one. If we don't have the logging data, or if there is any issue with the sensor downhole, we can use the machine learning to predict the row bulk in horizontal section to give us indication that I'm, I'm going with the same formation. I'm not hit the boundary above and the bottom. In addition, I can predict the, uh, now we are predicting the resistivity. So it will also help you to uh, uh, obtain some parameter indication about the saturation and other thing. I mean, you can use the machine learning in different application in horizontal section. But, at but for sure, you should have a bank of data to do this. Yeah, thank you, Prof, for your nice presentation. Could you please share a little bit more hint on AI and ML in cement area? Jeremy is asking. Yes, that, thank you, Dr. Jeremy. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, we, Alhamdulillah, we were able to predict the fluid drilling fluid the property in a real time. But for example, for the cement, we have for the cement formulation, whatever formation you will put in the field, you have to send a sample to the lab to measure the or the whole property. But now, once we have a record of millions and millions of the formulation of the cement, can we apply the AI if I give the same formulation, same water, water property to give me the indication and if we can avoid the lab test? This is the objective, especially which related to the thickening time, UCS, uh, gel strains, uh, rheology, because this will affect the probability of the cement and so on. The only lab that you will see, the only lab working for 24 hours, seven days, is the cement lab. It's a the whole year is working continuously because we have to send a sample to measure the property and to confirm the result. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof, for your um, presentation and uh, answering all the questions. Somebody is asking what software is used for ML. Yes, uh, uh, if we consider the first stage that I said, development stage, we use the MATLAB, but now we convert everything to Python because it's free, it's available for everyone. So now we are using the Python. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. Um, Thank for you. your presentation we really appreciate your free dedication thank so, you very much thank, yes, you. thank you so, much. so we will be welcoming um dr i mean mr toki alogma from shlom beja so he will be talking on class-based machine learning applications information evaluation uh mr toki can you please share your slides a uh, uh, prof, please. Um, you 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 need to stop sharing for. Uh, it depends like. depend how much you will pay for me. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> stop sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, prof. All right. Thank you, uh, Clement, for uh, this introduction. Let me share my screen. I 
Okay, do you guys uh, see my screen? Yes, copy. Okay, very well. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about uh, class-based machine learning information evaluation. Uh, my name is Turkil Ligman. I'm a petrophysicist with uh, Schlumber Deer. I've been with the company for uh, three years now. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll jump right into the uh, agenda of our presentation today. Okay, let me double check if the screen is moving. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, CBML and how it came to be developed, uh, the CBML workflow and the applications that we can use CBML uh, nowadays. So, so in the beginning, uh, it all started in, in 2015 when two uh, workflows were proposed to uh, overcome the limitations of processing and interpretation of uh, petrophysical data. So at that time, petrophysical data were considered to be huge data. However, um, with further investigation using the machine learning and... Uh, Please, the, talk, can, can you put the presentation in full screen mode? Okay, so I think I'm sharing the wrong screen. Let me double check. Sorry for this. It's the issue of having multiple screens sometimes it does not uh, come in handy. So, uh, maybe you can continue. Uh, you are cannot... you gentlemen able to see the okay? Yes, yes now? now, yes, now in full screen mode. Yes. Okay, so, um, again, uh, so further investigations again were uh, went into the how big the petrophysical data is and if we can apply different machine learning approaches on this data. Um, so what was uh, happening is that uh, we used different machine learning uh, methods such as the heat map and the matrix clustering and the elbow method uh, to uh, come to the conclusion that actually petrophysical data is small. However, the actual challenge went into the uh, the assumption that we can use one single clustering algorithm to uh, come up with all the results that we need. And uh, after that, uh, we apply different machine learning approaches. Uh, we come up with good results. However, these approaches exactly could not be applied to uh, processing and interpretation of log data. Why? Again, because of the assumption that uh, single uh, unsupervised clustering algorithms can be used. So here's the breakthrough. Uh, here is where the breakthrough came in the classification of petrophysical data. And this is the actual challenge that was tackled using a cascaded method of, uh, uh, of different uh, machine learning schemes and algorithms to uh, overcome this challenge. And the uh, methods that was that were used, uh, as we can see them here in the on the screen on the left hand side, uh, the CEC method, the GMM and the HMM uh, algorithms. So uh, these algorithms were actually developed by one of Schlumberger data scientists, Mr. Wu, who uh, helped into cascading the uh, these methods into the CB, CBML process. So uh, what happened here is that. Uh, these methods come into sequence, 
first they optim they optimize the clustering uh, the choice of clustering uh, they uh, take away the assumption of sphericity in the in the petrophysical data and they introduce the depth depth regularization so what we can see in the on the uh, log view on the right hand side are the three algorithms shown separately independently uh, however, the CBML combines all three, all these three algorithms into one uh, classification column, and we're going to see this in the uh, in the examples. So let's take a general overview of the how the CBML works and what is the actual workflow that goes into the CBML. So there are two scenarios that run uh, that C, the CBML runs uh, with in the background: the unsupervised learning and the supervised learning. So let's say that we have a training well, which has uh, measured logs. For example, gamma ray density, porosity, uh, resistivity. We can take these logs, uh, and the unsupervised learning will give us an automated zonation, as well as automated outlier detection, basically a QC method of uh, the results of the zonation that, we came, that the unsupervised learning came up with. Now, if we introduce interpreted logs into the training well as well, and uh, now this goes into the supervised learning where the machine uh, learns and takes into account the parameters and the interpretation of the, the interpretation that we uh, introduced. Later on, uh, the uh, domain experts such as petrophysicists or uh, any domain expert can QC their model uh, in the QC step. Um, if they are happy with it, then they save it and the, the models go into the model store. Now, when we move to the prediction phase, now this is you know, now we are done with the training phase. What we do if we move to the prediction phase, um, the learned models can be extracted from the model store, and then we can uh, apply them on a new set of well or set of wells that we want to predict on. Now, Let's say that this new set of this new well has a new set of measured logs. We can apply the model that we trained, and it will predict cluster labels as well as interpretation. Then, if we are happy with the uh, with the results that we got, and then we move on. If we are not happy, then the CBML uh, plugin has a retraining functionality. If there is any uh, outlier detection of or if the domain expert uh, observes any uh, abnormality or anomaly in the data, then the retraining functionality can be uh, can be used. So uh, let's take a look at the actual CBML uh, plugin that is in TechLog. So this is the actual CBML plugin, how it looks. Uh, once we open it, we choose the objective of the uh, of our uh, of our step, which is the first step, the training step. We give our model a name, and then we move into the training uh, variable selection, where we push our variables into the, uh, the pane shown here, and we classify or uh, give our variables the input and the output uh, selection. Once the selection is done, we go into selecting the well or the wells that we want to use for training. We can QC the, uh, the input and the output that we picked from the, uh, from the selected wells, and they are shown as logs, as we can see on the log view here. So this is just a QC method quickly before actually running the training. And then the last step in the training step is the classification. Now this classification, uh, these inputs and outputs go into a preset of defined algorithms in the CBML. Uh, where these algorithms, after they run, they give us uh, an outlier detection using uh, 1C uh, SVM. Uh, they classify the data based on the uh, characteristics of the formation and the, uh, and the uh, logs provided. And then uh, we get a reconstruction of the inputs and a reconstruction of the outputs. There is a forward model that goes into the outputs where it uh, they are reconstructed uh, and can be compared to the uh, actual outputs that we provided in the training well. And then there is the reverse model that goes into the inputs and give us a reconstruction of these uh, inputs with a reconstruction flag. This flag can be used as a QC method. 
once we are happy with this uh, uh, model, we can move on to the prediction phase. Now the prediction phase works when we uh, change our objective to predict, we select the model that we were happy with, and then we move to the selection of the target well or target wells that we want to predict on. Um, again, as we mentioned before, these target wells have set of inputs uh, that match the set of inputs that we use for training. We can QC these inputs in the log view and we can take a look at them. Uh, later on, we can uh, we go into the classification. Before the prediction, we go into the classification of the new inputs. Uh, we see, again, an outlier detection uh, QC flag. We see classification of these inputs. We see a reconstruction of these inputs with a reconstruction flag to give us uh, a QC uh, method if we need to go back and reclassify or retrain before we jump into the prediction, which is the last step. Once we are happy with these results, we go into the prediction. Again, the prediction goes into a, um, a set of predefined algorithms where we uh, get a reconstruction of the outputs, classification of the outputs, a QC flag, and a prediction of the interpretation if they were provided. Um, one more thing that uh, the CBML can give a little bit of flexibility to the domain expert where uh, these classes can be merged by the domain expert if they see that uh, a better optimization of these classes can be done using their experience. Uh, there is a, a way that these classes can be merged. Okay, so if we take a look at one of the examples and use cases um, we're showing here is the automated zonation and smart log interpretation. So this is one uh, key well that was selected. Um, the domain expert uh, came up with this uh, zonation of uh, shale and gas and water that are that is uh, present in this in this well, uh, and then this well went into the training uh, method or phase in CBML, and we outputted clustering as we can see on the screen here. Um, one difference between the, the logs on the left and the logs on the right is that we introduce an extra variable, an extra input, which is the resistivity on this, uh, on this well here, where it optimized the clustering. It actually gave us one extra class. However, it optimized the clustering in terms of uh, resolution where it, it removed the thin beds that were present in the thick shale layer here. So we can see a good... Uh, match between the uh, clustering that was done uh, from the CDML and the, the, the zonation that was done by the domain expert. Moving on to the, uh, to the prediction now, once we are happy with the, with the training that uh, we did and the results that we got, once we go to the prediction, um, we introduce our target wells. We have three target wells here that we want to predict the zonation that we got from the training on these uh, target wells. And we can see the CBML clustering on these uh, three target wells matching very well with the uh, domain expert zonation that was done. Uh, if we took at, if you look at well uh, C, the uh, track on the very right-hand side, there is a QC flag. There is an anomaly that shows on the QC flag here where the domain expert can go and take a look if we can determine that or we can uh, definitively say that the uh, this anomaly is correct and it's related to formation uh, then there is the retraining functionality that we mentioned in cbml which can incorporate this new information basically into the model and it can be saved and also the uh, the qc method can the QC method is updated as well and saved into the model. And lastly here, uh, I'm showing the, the petrophysical uh, interpretation that was done by the domain expert on this training well here, and the petrophysical interpretation that was done by CBML. So uh, this petrophysical interpretation was fed into the training. Uh, uh, the model was saved and it was predicted on these target wells. And we can see 
uh, good results between the uh, CBML interpretation and the domain expert interpretation. Okay, so actually in the, in the example uh, previously, we uh, covered almost four uses of CBML in that last example. We can do automated zonation. We can do automated uh, quality control. Uh, we can do automated clustering, and we can do automated uh, log uh, interpretation or petrophysical interpretation. So uh, CBML have many, many uses, and we can uh, apply these uses in the future. For example, we can use it for uh, supervised log processing and interpretation. We can use also CBML for real-time automated uh, log processing and interpretation. Let's say if we have uh, offset wells that we can obtain the processing data for, we can apply, we can use these process, process data for training, and we can apply the training results on the depth data in real time. Um, we also can use CBML as a, lear a continuously learning machine to uh, optimize uh, log interpretation and optimize uh, processing uh, for all domain experts in the future. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you all for, uh, for attending and for listening, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Yes, um, you have shown the, uh, the audience some very nice CBML applications for formation evaluation, and uh, you compared with domain expert uh, also interpretation. So somebody else is asking, is there a need to use deep learning information evaluation in case of supervised or unsupervised learning? That you didn't give the detailed results on that. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Is there a need to use deep learning information evaluation in case of supervised and unsupervised learning? Didn't give the detailed um, results. So I guess the person yeah. was. Um, I'm, not, I'm not honestly too familiar with deep learning. However, uh, the unsupervised and supervised learning can be done uh, depending on the data that we provide to the machine. So um, one of the main objectives that uh, the CBML comes uh, or the CBML uses is to minimize the user intervention uh, input into the, the actual, uh, let's say, pre uh, predefined algorithms of the CBML. However, uh, what we can do is provide interpretations or provide a set of parameters that we can use for training and we can apply it in the prediction. So here where the supervision and the, and the unsupervision comes uh, into play with the CBM. Uh, for auto zoning, do you use the SPAD zonation in your clustering procedure? or clustering is done purely based on data? So clustering is, is done uh, using, uh, again, the, the, the algorithms that uh, I mentioned in the beginning. Um, these algorithms, uh, again, uh, it was, so a single, a single set of algorithm or a single um, unsupervised algorithm is not very sufficient to be used, right? So this is where the CBML came into play and they wanted to use a cascaded set of algorithms to uh, take into account the petrophysical data. And these algorithms are CES, CEC, uh, GMM, and HMM. And they were named as PDCS, which is Petrophysical Data Classification Scheme. And they run in sequence uh, in the methods that I show in, the, in one of the slides. So, this is to overcome some of the challenges that actually were uh, found in 2015, where uh, they started to, to do the machine learning approaches on the petrophysical data. All right. Um, yeah, thanks so much for, for this. And then we'll be going for a seven minute break. We'll be back in seven minutes time. So see you in seven minutes time. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is the last live presentation. The other presentation we have is a recorded 10 minutes presentation. So this is like the last live presentation that we have for today.
then before we have the recorded tennis presentation. So please, uh, Johannes, have the floor. Okay, Clement, thanks for your introduction. So let me share my screen. Okay. So have you seen my screen okay? Yes, I, it's coming up now. Yes, yes, it's up. Uh, please just maximize, yes. yes. Thanks. Okay, 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 Clement. So um, I will make this, this presentation in about uh, 15 minutes. So I'll save the time. So if you have any question, for example, I can just take uh, one, one or two questions. So it, it will depend on my, um, my presentation. Okay, so let me um, enlarge my screen now. So it should be um, visible to yes, you. Yes, yes. So welcome to, yeah, thank you. So um, welcome to my presentation. Um, good evening, good afternoon, and um, good, um, good morning, if, uh, depending where, wherever you are. So my name is Jonas Nora. Uh, today I will present about uh, data-driven analytics in carbon capture and storage. So I believe that um, this topic is quite new because we know that um, we are dealing with uh, um, um, climate change where we have to do some carbon capture and storage. So this uh, application of data-driven analytics in carbon capture and storage is, uh, is, I believe, it's a quite new field where it is also potential to lots of researchers or lots of uh, stakeholders to also implement data analytics in this field. So the outline of my presentation will be um, divided to uh, five points. The first, I will uh, recap through uh, the geological storage of CO2, how we store the CO2 in the subsurface. And then I'll discuss about the role of data analytics in the life of CCS. And then I'll um, divide and decompose um, the role of data analytics in a site selection phase, and then the sequestration phase, and then the monitoring phase. Okay, so um, we, are in the, we are in the time of um, global warming. We know that um, climate change is also our concern, where from the Paris Agreement, we know that we have to limit the temperature below uh, two, uh, two centigrade. And we know that um, the temperature is rising about 100, uh, one centigrade per year. So we have to uh, be wise in uh, designing a kind of new tools or new technology that can reduce our emission from industries and um, intent, uh, carbon intensive um, activities. So um, carbon capture and storage is a viable solution for reducing greenhouse gases emission from carbon intensive uh, industries. We have seen lots of these applications in lots of industries. There are many options of storage. So the first one is a deep saline aquifer. The second one is the depleted oil and gas where we can store the CO2 in a depleted oil and gas field. So there are so many fields in this, uh, in this world we know that, uh, that has a great potential of storing the CO2. And then um, interestingly, CO2 can be also um, stored in an igneous hard rock basement. So um, it sounds like um, counterintuitive. Um, um, uh, the storage uh, must, um, must need a porous and then uh, highly permeable rocks, for example, sandstone. But of course, we also have um, hard rock basements, for example, in the Iceland, where most of the lithologies are all um, um, igneous rocks. So uh, it, seem, uh, it appears that CO2 can be also stored in the basement. So it's a quite interesting um, application. And then in CCS, we know that these three important aspects of storage should be really concerned. The first one is capacity or how much we can store. And then the second one is the containment, how much we can contain. So capacity and containment is different. So capacity uh, means that uh, the quantification or the volume of CO2, but the containment is that how we can control or how we can contain the CO2 in the subsurface so that it won't leak somewhere. And then about the injectivity, how permeable of the reservoir so that when we inject the CO2, it will uh, better distribute in the, um, in the reservoir. Okay, so there are lots of examples in CCS facilities, we know, uh, but these three facil uh, facilities are quite the most important CCS uh, projects. So the first one is a Sleipner CCS in North Sea. So it's a, it's a project from Equinor where it is, uh, it is uh, categorized as the depleted oil and gas carbon capture. The second one is a Quest CCS. Uh, so um, um, uh, in, a, in a boundary dam in Canada, it is operated by Shell and the utility company in Canada. 
and it is categorized as a saline aquifer. And then the third one, uh, as I said before, we can store the CO2 in the in the basement. So there is uh, there is a project um, uh, running in the Iceland. The name of the project is uh, Carpis for Carpfix CCS. Okay, so um, when we talk about uh, how the analytics or data analytics can be um, applied in CCS, uh, we have to also discuss about uh, the three phases of carbon capture and storage. Okay, so the first stage of carbon capture and storage is a site selection, where engineers are and geoscientists are working together to um, select uh, what is the best site or location for storing the CO2. And then after site selection, we are going through the sequestration phase where um, engineers are uh, engineers are conducting um, um, some sequestration or um, injection of CO2, whether it is um, pure C uh, CCS or CCUS, uh, where we can inject the CO2 to enhance the uh, uh, oil, or we, uh, we know as this EUR. And then after we inject the CO2 in the reservoir, we have to monitor. So we have to um, um, uh, we have to make sure that the CO2 in the reservoir can be safely contained so that it won't leak somewhere else. So we need a monitoring. And through these three phases, this uh, data analytics are applied. So for example, in the site selection, the data analytics can be um, applied in the um, um, first, how we uh, select the storage, and then uh, how we can classify the phases. So I believe that uh, many speakers uh, before me have been already discussing about the phases classification. And uh, perhaps um, um, one of my colleagues here, Roderick Ferris, I heard um, his presentation about um, seismic uh, phases classification. So that can be also um, used in this uh, phase. And then we are going through the sequestration where we can develop some proxy model reservoir simulation or data-driven reservoir modeling. And also we can apply the um, data analytics in history matching. And in the last phase, um, TPPs or induced seismicity. And then it can be um, applied to, um, um, to, to monitor the plume migration and then to monitor the well scaling and then the equiver leakage. So in the next slides, I will uh, discuss each of this phase. Uh, so in the, in the site selection phase, where we discuss about data analytics in this phase. So um, one of the examples that we can, uh, we can know is that um, uh, we, have, uh, um, we, uh, we have to know that um, this properties for permeability is the most uh, is the most important um, property in uh, carbon capture. So it's not only um, permeability in isotropic uh, because we need to discuss the permeability in inosotropic. Uh, it means that um, the vertical permeability is different from the horizontal permeability. So here you can see uh, the KV is different from KH, and we can define this different using KV over KH ratio. So the question is, if we are, um, um, if we are, um, if we are given, for example, a facious model. So the question is, which location in our facious model is the best for storing the CO2? So here, okay. So here, the knowing vertical to horizontal permeability ratio is very important uh, to rank the storage options. And it depends on whether or, uh, whether our trap is structural. So in the structural trap the KV over KH must be large in order the CO2, uh, to, uh, it can migrate um, upward. Or in the case of a stratigraphic trap, because uh, we deal with, um, we deal with lateral continuity. So it should be uh, migrating uh, in the horizontal direction. It means that the KV over KH must be small. Okay, so unfortunately there, are, uh, there is no formula that can define the relationship between the geological data, uh, the sedimentary uh, um, and textures to, um, to, um, to give you over KH. So that's why we need to use uh, data analytics to predict the KV over KH from uh, sedimentary uh, data. Okay. So one of the data that, uh, that is uh, quite open source here, you can see uh, uh, lots of uh, open source data in the North Sea. And one of the examples are here published by Geo Provider AS, where you can find lots of uh, data, about uh, 1000 documented data. And in, in this data, you can see lots of um, sedimentary data, for example, core porosity, core permeability, and sedimentary descriptions, such as uh, roundness, sorting, or um, structure sanitation. Okay. So we know that um, there are lots of controls on permeability. For example, here, 
um, it is shown um, uh, the roundness of the sediment uh, of the sediment or the sedimentary roundness, and then the sedimentary um, 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 sorting. And then we also um, um, need to quantify um, uh, the control of uh, cementation to the permeability. Okay, so based on these concepts, we can utilize an artificial neural network in order to predict the KV over KH from given properties, for example, porosity, grain density, sorting, roundness, and cementation. So based on this idea, okay, so after you can, uh, after we can utilize the ANN to predict this KV over KH, it is expected that when we input this data, it can automatically give us the ratio of KV and KH. So that's really important because if we uh, do this, okay, so here, for example, you are given um, a facious model where there, there is a lacustrine or glacial uh, deposit or um, in the, in the um, um, alluvial or, or perhaps a turbidite system, you can determine from this facious model which location is the best to store the CO2, how we can do that, okay? So we know that from facious model, we can predict also uh, the sedimentary textures, okay? So for example, in the core base, uh, in, the, in, the, in the core uh, description, you have the core, and then you can also describe the sedimentary textures, the sedimentary sorting. And it, it is really simple because you have a laboratory, right? You can measure it in the laboratory. And after you have this data, when you apply the model, it will give you the KV over KH prediction. And you can tell this which in which interval is the best for storing CO2. So, so that's the general idea of we can, how we can um, apply the data analytics in um, storage selection. And the second phase, we know that um, in carbon capture and storage, after we have uh, we have done with the uh, storage selection, uh, we are in the sequestration phase when we uh, when we inject the CO2 in the reservoir. Okay, so one of the examples in um, 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 this sequestration phase, uh, of course, we know that reservoir simulation is really important to predict uh, the behavior or the dynamics of fluids inside the reservoir, and we can also monitor the pressure distribution inside the reservoir. But the problem is, if if we um, do, uh, if we um, do a numerical simulation, it it takes really long time to um, to run a one just one simulation, and it is uh, it has some numerical error, and uh, because uh, this works uh, with a numerical method, for example, a finite difference or finite element. Okay, so the idea is how we can um, um, apply data analytics to streamline. Okay, or to make this reservoir simulation faster than when, uh, when we do with a finite difference or numerical simulation. So we can train uh, the reservoir simulation. So um, uh, for example, uh, you, uh, you are running, for example, um, 10 simulation runs. And then from this 10 simulation runs, you have this data, right? So you have this reservoir grids, reservoir data and our PVT properties. And then after the simulation run, uh, you have the result uh, for uh, whatever, for example, the water, uh, water saturation or pressure. So in this um, input and output, you train this 10 simulation runs, and then you have the model. And then after you have the model, you again run a reservoir simulation. Sorry, um, you apply this model into a new input, okay? So for example, you have a reservoir in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, different distribution of porosity or permeability, you can implement this model to predict uh, pressure and water saturation on, 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 on that new reservoir model, okay? So this is um, intensively um, researched. One of the case study is in Oldway Basin. It's a really important basin in Australia. And then one of the research here that I show um, is one of the examples of, of, uh, of, of this application, which is called a smart proxy model. Okay, so smart proxy model, um, uh, it runs on the surrogate modeling, surrogate modeling, okay? So in this, you can see the difference between uh, the numerical simulation and the proxy model, and then the difference between the water saturation. So we can see that it is really close, but of course, uh, to, to make this, uh, to make this a very good model, oh, sorry, a very good uh, result, of course, you have to train lots of simulation runs. For example, 20 simulation runs, it will be um, enough to 
uh, to to um, to uh, to produce a um, a good um, result, okay, and a small error. And then we go to the data analytics in monitoring phase. So I heard from from my last speaker, Wei Chang Li. He is uh, discussing about um, DAS or DTS. And of course, DAS and DTS is also can we also apply to monitor the CO2? Okay. So here, for example, you uh, you see there is an injector. So the injector injects the CO2, and then when it, it uh, and then the CO2 will migrate into the reservoir. Okay. And then we place another model. Sorry, another um, another another well, or uh, there is an existing well where we can also um, plan or um, use a fiber optic cable, okay, in order to detect the micro seismicity, okay? So here, because there is no micro seismicity or no um, induced uh, seismicity, so you can see uh, here the traffic light is green. So it means that you can continue the injection, okay? So this is a traffic, uh, traffic light model, okay? So, um, you can see here in the dash record, you uh, you uh, you will not um, see any um, um, any uh, trace or any um, any events detected on this uh, dash record. But when an, an an effect happens in this reservoir, for example, um, the the, uh, the, uh, the pressure uh, the pressure have um, the pressure has uh, disturbed the fractures. Okay, so there will be a, a small, really really small earthquake. So it is not. Um, it is not. Uh, it is just below the zero magnitude. Okay. So this very small event can be detected using fiber optic cable. Okay. So I, actually, I've I have researched um, the sensitivity, so it can go down to zero magnitude. Okay. So that's why the fiber optic cable is the future of monitoring anything. Okay. So it can be uh, it can be used to monitor production fluid. Or anything else we can um, we can do with fiber optic. Okay, so because there is an event, of course the traffic light is going to yellow, so it means that you have to slow down the injection. Okay, but when the event increases, it means that you have to stop the injection because the traffic light here is red. Okay, so it means that you have um, um, uh, you will receive lots of events detected in the dash record here. Okay. So in the traditional method, how we can um, uh, how we can determine the location of the of of the hypocenters of the earthquake, okay? So for example, Umair bin Wahid has been already researched about how we can uh, how we can use the data analytics to find um, the uh, the distribution uh, the hypocenter of any earthquake, okay? So in the traditional method, we do the inverse modeling to find the hypocenters, okay? But data analytics can be used to streamline this um, this um, this implementation. How? Okay. So um, um, we can use what is called as the convolutional neural network or CNN. Okay. So the idea is we can train a model that can um, identify, for example, from an image or from um, from a data. Okay. So here, for example, you can see. Um, um, for example, you can see here, there is a trace here, there's an event here. You can train the model in order to, um, to recognize this trace. So whenever uh, uh, this appears, so the CNN will uh, inform you that there is an event or earthquake happens in your reservoir, okay? So how we train the model? So we, uh, uh, we can uh, forward model. Uh, uh, so for example, we have a very simple velocity model and then uh, we, uh, we distribute these hypocenters, and then we do the forward modeling to, um, to, to, uh, to generate this data, okay? So this is the synthetic data, okay? And then after this, um, uh, we add with the ambient noise, okay? And then after we have this training data, we make a CNN model to train on this data, okay? So this is the input, okay? Sorry, so this is the input, and then this is the output, okay? So the output will be the X, Y, Z, and the origin time of the earthquake or the induced micro seismicity, okay? And then we fit uh, the, read, uh, the real dust seismogram to the CNN, and then it will predict uh, the hypocenter, okay? So this is the ar architecture of the CNN, okay? So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the architectures we, uh, we use is the ResNet 50, okay? 
Why ResNet 50? Because it is more robust than the other architectures. So we can uh, we can put uh, striding layers here, stride layers, and then more convolutional layers here. Okay. So this is the result you can see here. Uh, there is a very very small difference between the ground truth or uh, the calculated from the uh, uh, or this is the true model. Okay, the synthetic model, and then we uh, compare with the result from the CMM here. Okay, so you can see here a uh, very very small difference, but of course you have to uh, train your model and avoid some overfitting. Okay, because we are talking about a neural network, we have to care about some overfitting or some um, irregularities in the data. So we have to pre-process data first before we go to the machine learning or the neural network, okay? So in conclusion, um, data analytics is applied in three uh, phases. So in the selection, uh, in, the, in the site selection, we can use the artificial neural network to predict the KV over KH ratio from sedimentary data. And then in sequestration phase, we can use the data analytics to, um, to make a proxy model or surrogate modeling, okay, to streamline the reservoir simulation uh, processes so that we avoid a lengthy time of running reservoir simulation. And of course, in the monitoring phase, okay, if we use uh, DAS or any, um, um, any seismograms, okay, or geophones, we can train a convolutional neural network in order to identify and recognize um, event, okay, uh, from, from, from the records to inform us whether or not uh, we have uh, this um, events in our reservoir, okay? So um, thank you all for uh, your, um, um, uh, thank you for your, uh, thank you for attending this presentation. So I hope you, uh, you have um, information about how we can uh, utilize data analytics in carbon capture and storage. So if uh, you have any questions, perhaps I can, uh, I can accept or I can receive one or two questions uh, very fast. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So someone said, um, thanks for, thank you, Johannes, very clear explanation. Uh, thank you very much. I dropped your email address with them. So um, anyone that wants to ask for that question can use the email address and then uh, would, and, and I'm sure that you guys would be able to, to respond to you. So we have um, a 10 minutes uh, recorded presentation, which is the last uh, presentation. And then after that, we, if there are any general question, I we have one. I don't know if who asked the question is still around. Then we'll have a closing remark uh, by the chairman of uh, Petroleum Engineering, who is the also the chairman of the organizing committee, give a closing remark. And then um, if we get the approval to to be able to send the, the recordings, we would since we have the information of everyone, we'll be able to to do that. So let me share the recording. Happy to be with you today. I would like to start by thanking KQPM and College of Petroleum Engineering for their trust uh, for inviting me to part of this uh, event. This presentation will shed light on the future of machine learning and oil and gas industry. I know that we are towards the end of the day, so don't worry. I work hard to ensure that these slides will be nice and easy to discuss. What the future will look like? How to predict? Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, said the best way to predict the future is to create. So, my objective of this presentation is to achieve that goal, creating our future in all the oil gas sector, technology, life drilling, production, and reservoir engineering. So let's start by geology. Geology is 
imagine that we have uh, a drone equipped with machine learning vision capability that can see rocks and rocks and support. Not only that, but can take some samples and do chemical, physical analysis. It is not my system. Actually, NASA already did technology on one. So, how do you think this will affect their Yeah, hi, Clement. I think the sound is gone. Uh, sorry, there is no sound from the feedback that I just got. So I will, no, I now we can it. hear it. Now we can hear it. Oh, now you can hear? Yes. Okay. If the sound is not clear, I'm available now. I wish I can do it live. But uh, this, but the picture is gone. Okay, then I can share it with you. After that, so that is, I can jump in now. All right. So, all right. So let me stop. So now you are free to share your slide. Okay. Can you see the slides now? Yes. Can I see yes. it in play mode? Yes, clear. Okay. okay, sorry, just one second. I think I played the one with OT. It is becoming double virtual, you know, you are there and oh, yeah. recorded. <laughs> oh. Okay, just give me a super use of AI. Uh, okay, just one second. Let me try to fix this technical glitch. You allow me? Okay. I have more, but so I lose everything. Okay. Okay, so uh, can you see the screen? Yes, I can hear you. You can cannot see, okay. no, no, we cannot see the screen. But we cannot see, just hear you. Sorry for that. What about now? Yes. Yes, we can see your desktop. You can see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry for the technical glitch. Let me try to open that. Okay. 
So we'll start, sorry for the technical uh, glitch. Uh, the presentation, first of all, I would like to thank KGBM and CPG for uh, giving me the opportunity to be part with you in this event. I know that this is, uh, we have really good, lengthy, interesting uh, workshop. Don't worry, my presentation will be light and inshallah easy to, to digest. I will talk about or the next few slides will shed light on the future of machine learning in oil and gas industry. So, uh, okay, so the best way to predict the future, as Abraham Lincoln said, is to create it. So one of the objective of uh, today's slide or my presentation is hopefully to shed some light of how can we create the future of machine learning on the different sector in our industry, geology, seismic, drilling, production, and the reservoir engineering as well. So let's start with the geology. We know that it is uh, field oriented. It has a lot of uh, the geologists usually go to the field, try to analyze the rocks and do some experiment. Imagine that we have a drone that have machine learning or computer vision capability, which can analyze the rock, see the minerals, and also pick some sample to do physical or chemical experimental. This is not science fiction. Actually, NASA already did that in Mars. So imagine that this technology was, or was integrated on uh, one of the, not only one drone, but actually on an army of drones. How this will raise the capability of the geology or the geologist will give him the capability to explore and analyze all the area up to the inch level will be to see, analyze, and explore all that area, providing him with very clear high resolution idea about his area, missing zero spot in that, uh, in any area that he would like to study. In other dimension, when we go to the seismic uh, area, if you look to the seismic from its simple format, it is a picture of the earth layer. So let's try to see the picture technology it used to be a little bit complex and lengthy in, in the past. But with the new technology, it become really provide high resolution, become fast result, and also easy to apply. So how machine learning will affect seismic uh, domain, I think it will have almost similar, uh, similar positive impact. It will result in higher resolution seismic uh, picture. Add to that, it will be fast because uh, think about the edge analysis when uh, the operational crew will shoot their seismic and able to see the result will easily or will have the capability to adjust their geophone and see the result in very good way. Also, add to that the interpretation. AI machine learning will be uh, can train to uh, see trend, see shape, and able to identify anticline fault and so on. This will unleash potential capability even in very large scale. Moving to the reservoir, usually this is one of the complex computational part in the petroleum engineering side, has a lot of pre post analysis. So, and really it's time consuming, take very long time to, to be conducted from the data side and from the computational side. So what if we have a machine learning agent that will help to do the data processing, bring all the data and make it ready really shrinking the time from weeks or months to a few days. Add to that, integrating it to the real time. So it can really know what's happened in the operation from production and drilling and feed it into the domain. Add to that, the uh, com uh, quantum computing. This will allow the reservoir engineer to develop or to go with millions and millions of scenario and really very or in few minutes, allowing him to uh, get the most optimum result of, as a development plan in the reservoir. Okay, now moving to the drilling. Uh, talking about drilling, I really I can't stay up to tomorrow talking about AI and drilling domain. And I really would like to thank uh, Dr. Salah for uh, paving the road for that one. Also, Dr. Abdel Abdel Rahim and Dr. Abdel Majid for helping me to know more about that area. So AI and drilling is really big and wide area, starting from 
uh, stack uh, by prediction, ROP optimization, lost, uh, lost circulation model, in addition to the kick prediction. But also there are other models that can will help drilling from machine learning module, such as agent that can have uh, offset well analysis that can consume or actually can collect all the needed data related to a specific well from morning report, completion report, mud, even it can, for example, will crunch the emails for particular well, and all that data will convert it from data to information. Add to that, what if we have a simulator, drilling simulator, that will crunch all that data to give the most optimum result. This will really boost the drilling performance and lead to very high quality wells. Okay, let me talk about other technology related to machine learning. For example, 3D printing. Yes, it is a physical one, but imagine an AI agent that will analyze the formation top, predict the new one, and help to develop or to print specific bit customized to that formation. How will it will improve the formation or improve the drilling operation? And if we talk about robotics, this is totally different dimension on drilling it will affect sharply the drilling operation side. One of the things that I would like, you can consider me as thinking loud, the next site is human-centric. It deals with the human, they need them to move safely and freely within the rig site. Imagine that was replaced by the rig. The rig site will sharply reduce and become much, much smaller. Add to that, the offshore operation will move down to the seabed because no humans there. They are robots, so they can do that drilling from the seabed level. Moving to the our production side, it is really a nightmare to deal with a massive amount of, uh, of data. So having an AI agent will help in doing real-time monitoring, set alert for abnormality, and help to move to a decision like support information to help ensure that provide or make really good uh, production rate and ensure everything is smooth from that side. Before moving to the next step, uh, next step I would like to take you to 1859 when uh, Edwin Dark come with a new idea at that time to drill for oil. Actually, the oil industry before 1859, they used to collect the fluid or the water from the surface or have a small holes for oil collection. But uh, Edwin Drake, he was, he was thinking or dreaming of new technology to drill for oil. When he shared that idea with oil expertise, this was the result. They thought that that was a crazy idea. The same for all the things in machine learning AI. It might seem crazy, but really down the road, it will become a reality. This is what I believe, and this is I hope to work with you towards those crazy and really ambitious idea. So now, since we talk about future of machine learning, really it will come to our mind, our mind, what about the future of jobs? If machine learning, AI will do all those great things about or in the oil industry, what will be our future? Maybe the AI will take everything and uh, there will be no future for such job. Actually, I would like to move to different area for the agriculture, for example. When they start implementing a new technology, the result was increase in production and improve the quality of their product. The same will happen here in the oil and gas. The moment we start integrating this technology, our operation will be safer, faster, and more cost effective. As a result, this will increase the production and make it uh, more complex. It, for example, uh, the drilling now we drill, the deepest well we have worldwide is 15 kilo uh, uh, TVD. With such a model, I'm sure it will exceed that number, it will reach 30 TVD. And the multilateral, now the maximum in the range of 15 multilateral. With such technology, it will easily reach 20 or even 30 multilateral how we will achieve that one, how we will remove the boundary and move to new level of such operation, AI will not help on that one. This will be on the shoulder of our oil and gas engineers, our petroleum engineers, 
or who will, who will help to uh, reshape the technology to ensure support the humanity with our precious oil and gas. With this, I reach the end of my presentation and I'm going to be more than happy to, to have your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kale, for the uh, shots and the, a, a summarizing presentation of um, everything we have. So now we have come to the end of this uh, session. So if there is um, any question, uh, but I believe a lot of those questions have been answered and that's why we had some shift in the schedule uh, during the presentation. If anyone have question for Dr. Salem, please, uh, you can ask in the chat box. Okay, uh, let's let's hope um, they will. Uh, doctor, I want you to just drop your email, any email you are comfortable with, just in case somebody wants to drop a question. Uh, in the in the again, again, please. I couldn't hear you. You can drop yes. your email. Okay. You can drop your email address, just in case somebody wants to drop a question. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So um, I welcome Doctor Dulaziz to give a closing remark for this event, and then we hope that um, if we can get any presentation slide that. We can share from this guys. We'll coordinate with kicks to share to the attendees. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I thought, uh, well, first of all, I really thank uh, all the panelists for taking out time and uh, I mean, being with us. And I hope all the participants have enjoyed, uh, you know, from these presentations and we Hope to have such events in the future. There's nothing more to add. I think uh, people have been listening for long. They must have been tired. So um, I, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. And thank you again uh, for the, all the organizers, uh, especially Clement who has uh, managed it very well. And, uh, and thank you for the sponsorship of our you know, administration. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Salem, are you there? Somebody dropped a question, but I don't know um, if you can quickly answer before we close the event about, do you think about data secrecy? Do you think they can grow at same pace as great tech giant? So what um, do you think about the high secrecy level attached to data by oil and gas? And do you think because of that, they can grow at the same pace as the tech giant? The question is not clear. So okay. draw what? Do you think they can, we say, what do you think about the data secrecy of the oil and gas? You say, do you, um, I mean, your, your opinion about the high secrecy level attached to data, you know, by okay. oil and gas? Data is uh, one of the biggest challenge in, in AI in general. Data is the new oil, they call it. Actually, data is the blood for any AI model. Previously, if we take just it, it was in the DNA, not in only on oil and gas. In all the energy sector, data was a secret, so th they don't have the concept of sharing a data. It was actually in the, in the policy of any organization to ensure to secure the data keep it in very secure uh, database and thing. AI, when it come, it really collapses with that thing. So it need to have open data. And then now we have the two different uh, uh, worlds. AI need a lot of data, energy, they don't want to share data. But now I think those things are really moving towards each other. And the barrier, I don't say that move totally, but now they understand the benefit of sharing the data. But now, also in addition, by having more secure layer to ensure that the data will be secured with AI model in a good way, I think this problem will be solved. It needs some time, but the good thing, we are moving positively toward that direction in most of the energy sectors. I hope I answered the question uh, with this. Yeah, I, I hope so to source. Um... Uh, the person asking about the certificate, actually, uh, for the events we organize at Kicks at the moment, we don't give out a uh, certificate. However, if this change, uh, they have your records because you registered for the event. So if change, definitely 
a certificate will be emailed, but now there is actually no certificate. Yeah, once again, thank you all for attending this event. And uh, most especially, I would want to thank the speakers for that are available uh, for giving out their time in uh, giving this um, free presentation. And then people don't have to pay. And then we have we also have for uh, the committee who have set this program up. And then so finally, our, attend our attendees who are able to stay up to this uh, 38 minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, um, we hope to see you in a consequent event. So, some uh, can we get the video record? Uh, usually, you know, this is like a mini conference and not just a webinar. So, you know, we will need to get the permission of all the speakers. You know, just like in a conference, um, re uh, video recordings are not shared for conferences because you would need to get permission from many people. So it's also similarly applied in this mini conference or forum that we have because of the number of speakers involved. And so trying to get unified approval may be something difficult. However, what we can do is that if any of the speaker agree to share their slide, we will see if that is possible, but we are not promising. So anyway, um, the, for us, is the knowledge that you gather and then how you apply that as a researcher, as a student, or in your job is what matters. Usually these webinars are paid for, but we have volunteer speaker and then the, the management of CPG and the community decided to make it free. But anyway, so thank you all so much. And then see you in our future events. Salam Alaikum. Thank you all. Looking forward to meet you in a future event. Thank you.